very good morning everyone how are you all my dear students i hope you all are doing very well and i am your diksha ma'am and i welcome you to the pw english so how are you feeling so how are you feeling today tomorrow is your exam and i i know how is that feeling one day before the exam is there something uh, happening down your stomach the butterflies and all or not or are you normal <laughs> so today yes you heard it right so i'll be covering the entire 11th and 12th class syllabus and i will be covering only the most important topics right so from where you know every year the questions are asked so we'll be covering the entire syllabus the most important topics so i hope you all are uh, ready for that revision see most of the things will be from ncrt i want before one day before exam you should just go over the entire zoology section in one go right and then in the evening go for your physics and chemistry and botany whatsoever you like so here just make sure you will cover the entire zoology with me a quick revision of everything that's quite important that can be asked in the exam all right so be very serious not that much serious yeah and let's get started so we'll go by uh, you know uh, topic by topic so we'll, first of all we'll start with the class 11th structural organization in animals fine okay so first of all in structural organization in animals there are two uh, topics one is animal tissues another is cockroach fine so the first is your animal tissues in animal tissue the most important topic is your cell junctions and second are your epithelial tissue so first of all if we talk about the epithelial tissue epithelial tissue are a vascular epithelial tissue they are a vascular and the cells they are tightly packed cells are tightly packed with uh, less intercellular space fine so here you can see this is the first diagram that you can see these are the flattened cell this is a squamous epithelium in squamous epithelium the cells are flattened and uh, where will you find it at all places wherever you want to do the function of diffusion wherever the function of diffusion is there for example i say in the filtration membrane in kidney or i say in the bowman's capsule you will find the squamous epithelium there so what is the location yes what is the location of the squamous the first location is as i've told you in the blood vessels because there we have a lot of blood vessels second alveoli alveoli or air sacs air sacs of lungs fine also where do you find it in you will find it in bowman's capsule yes guys animal kingdom will also be covered in fact i'll cover the entire animal kingdom each and every line of ncrt so i have made a ppt where we'll be doing the entire thing okay so one every each and every line of ncrt is written so i am very serious for your revision so you should also be right okay next we have these cells cube like cells this is a cuboidal epithelium cuboidal epithelium in the cuboidal epithelium as you know the cells are cube like cube in shape and where it is present in the nephron nephron is a part of your kidney and in the nephron which portion pct proximal convoluted tubule and there it also has microvilli so you call it as brush bordered so if someone ask you where is the brush bordered cuboidal epithelium present you will say in the pct or in the other way the question can be asked what type of epithelium pct have then you, you will be writing brush bordered epithelium okay all, all right so so in the other thing in the cuboidal epithelium what do you have yes in the cuboidal epithelium or where do you have the cuboidal epithelium you have this in the germinal epithelium that means the one in the germ cells in the testes and ovaries and another important thing in the ducts of glands in the ducts of glands which glands like your salivary gland and pancreatic gland so these are the two most important where is cuboidal epithelium present smaller ducts of your gland which glands your salivary gland and your pancreatic right or pancreas whereas the brush bordered one is present in the pct all right then we have this type of epithelium because it has cilia so this is ciliated epithelium so what's the function of cilia cilia are hair like structure what are they they are hair like structure and the this cilia this cilia which is hair like structure this one is present in your fallopian tube and respiratory tract fallopian tube and respiratory tract why do we want this in the fallopian tube because we want the movement of ova we want the movement of guys yes we want the movement of ova and we want the movement of mucus in the respiratory tract yes mohit entire zoology will be covered i am saying entire zoology will be covered 
so trust me i will cover each and every point whatever is very important and relevant don't worry about that every chapter will be covered today okay all right so the, these are the three or uh, the four most important one and this one is your columnar this is a columnar where do you find the columnar in columnar we have tall cell and sometime you also find the goblet cell there what is a goblet cell unicellular gland goblet cell is a unicellular gland that secretes mucus fine so the columnar is present in your glands whether it's a gastric gland or it is a intestinal gland right also your glands are of two type if you remember your glands are of two types one is your unicellular gland guys and another is your multicellular gland unicellular and multicellular fine in unicellular what example we have goblet cell goblet cell is also known as mucus cell it is also known as mucus cell in multicellular we have sweat gland and we have oil gland okay multicellular glands can be of different types it can be exocrine the one with the ducts and it can be endocrine which is ductless the secretion of endocrine gland we have entire chapter for this chemical control and coordination that are hormones that are hormones fine in the exocrine we have the sweat gland and oil gland because they have ducts right okay so uh, what are the glands which have ducts exocrine the ductless endocrine okay one more uh, one more question what are the uh, what are the secretions of endocrine hormones so placenta is exocrine or endocrine placenta what is placenta placenta is that organ that connects fetus and the mother it also secrete hormones so it is endocrine it is endocrine okay so anything that is ductless is endocrine anything that is ductless is endocrine fine guys okay moving further you can see these diagrams here this one is of a unicellular gland sometime the question can be diagrammatic okay so that's why i brought all the diagrams here so here this one is your unicellular and this one is a multicellular gland fine and then you have this one which is a compound epithelium the function of this squamous epithelium was the function of squamous epithelium was related with diffusion so whenever you need to diffuse things whereas columnar and cuboidal has a function of of absorption and secretion if you want to secrete something secrete means whenever i'm talking about cell secretion i i'm saying that the cell is producing something and throwing away the things fine whereas secretion uh, whereas absorption means to take up the things so wherever the absorption and secretion is taking place you will see two types of cells eh? it can be cuboidal it can be columnar right like secretion and reabsorption is taking place in pct so we have cuboidal so here secretion and absorption is taking place in the gut so we have columnar fine and cilia is for movement of substances for movement of substances all right okay next we have the compound so the function of uh, the compound epithelium because it is multi layer it is multi layer it has a number of layer so its function is protection so where do you find the compound epithelium in compound we have different kinds of uh, categories so the one category we have is stratified the stratified squamous stratified squamous keratinized the one with the keratin is present in your skin whereas the same stratified squamous non keratinized where do you find this one you find this in the pharynx and buccal cavity pharynx and buccal cavity pharynx and buccal cavity fine guys all right yes yes all right all right okay next moving further to the next topic which is very very important junctions very 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 important topic okay so what are cell junction guys what are cell junction cell junctions are the point of communication between two cells for example i have this cell i have this cell now these cells need to communicate what type of junctions junctions do they have one type of a junction is tight another is adhering and third is gap junction okay so if the question arises or it is asked in the exam you have to find some of the word, words okay what are those words for example in the tight junction it stops substances from leaking right it is the junction that will not allow the passage of substances from one cell to the another fine then we have adhering junction if the answer is adhering the sentence must be containing the word cement it must be containing the word cement so it performs cementing to keep neighboring cells 
together third we have gap junction in gap junction two cells these two cells they allow the passage of substances like this okay they allow the passage of substances like this so here what word you will see communication with each other and cytoplasm that means the cytoplasm of both the cells they will be running here or there okay so i hope this is clear just quickly read these lines guys seriously read these guys these are from ncrt or what you should do uh, besides uh, uh, this revision class you should op also open your ncrt books okay all right so here tight junction help to stop substances from leaking across a tissue adhering junction perform the cementing to keep neighboring cells together gap junction facilitate the cells to communicate with each other by connecting the cytoplasm of adjoining cells for rapid transfer of ions small molecules and sometimes big molecules okay ari what doubt do you have anjali yes we'll be covering almost all the diagrams which are very important okay so this is about the tight junction let's talk about the connective tissue let's talk about the connective tissue so most uh, you know uh, important questions that are asked first of all is from the classification of connective tissue second the cells of connective tissue and third the examples or the locations so the first one guys that we have is a loose then we have a dense and then we have a specialized okay all right so here in the loose one we have areola and we have adipose where do you find these both both are present beneath the skin both are present beneath the skin both are present beneath the skin if i talk about the dense one dense have further two categories regular and irregular irregular is present in the skin in the dermis of skin in the dermis layer of skin where is the regular one where do you find the regular one regular one is present in the tendon and ligaments then you have specialized one in specialized one we have endoskeleton or the supportive one in which you have bone and cartilage and the last is a fluid connective tissue in fluid we have blood and lymph in the fluid connective tissue there are no fibers there are no fibers in the matrix fine another thing that can be asked the diagram of bone if you have seen the diagram in the ncrt the diagram of a bone is like this and what are these structures these structures are known as lamellae so if someone ask you out of bone and cartilage which has lamellae you will say bone out of bone and cartilage which is non pliable that is bone whereas cartilage is pliable bone have calcium salts whereas lacunae the empty spaces or the fluid filled spaces in which the cells are present they are present in both they are present in both lamellae are only present in the bone whereas lacunae they are present in both the cartilage is pliable the bone is non pliable because it is made up of calcium salts okay all right very nice so that's the most important things here moving further let's talk about the muscles okay so i have one chart of a muscle okay so i have to make it one for today i had it but accidentally i i think deleted it i got it got deleted okay so okay so what type of muscles we have we have skeletal muscle we have smooth muscle and we have guys cardiac muscle the most important and the most often question asked is which is cylindrical the skeletal is cylindrical the smooth is fusiform and the cardiac is also cylindrical okay another thing which one has how many nucleus the smooth and cardiac they are uninucleated this one is multinucleated and it's all nucleus they are present at periphery that means on the external side whereas here it is uninucleated this is also uninucleated this is how it looks like with single nucleus and this one is branched this muscle 
is branch the cardiac muscle is branched all right another thing to note here is that the sarcomere are present sarcomere they are present in the skeletal muscle they are absent in the smooth muscle they are present in the cardiac muscle they are present in the cardiac muscle the skeletal muscle is voluntary whereas this one is involuntary not under your control this is also involuntary fine guys okay talking about uh, the uh, junctions this does not have any junction this have gap junction whereas this one have intercalated disc between two cell for example this is cell 1 this is cell 2 and this structure is intercalated disc and intercalated disc have two type of junction one is a gap junction guys and another is desmosome so if someone asks you which muscle has striations the alternative light and dark band that will be that muscle which have sarcomere so this one is non striated that means you will see the smooth appearance smooth texture this is non striated this is non striated this is striated this is also striated let me talk about the location this is present on the bones where it is present on the bones and where the others uh, other uh, where are the other locations of skeletal upper one third of esophagus upper one third of esophagus find and your body wall where do you find the smooth one you find it in the urinary bladder your gut GIT, stomach and intestine, blood vessels. Fine. And cardiac one, you all know where it is present in the heart. So that's the difference. Just look, look here. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Just give a look to this entire chart and then we'll move further. So where is your uh, skeletal muscle present? In the bones. And uh, it is voluntary or involuntary? It is voluntary. Does it have any striations? It do have striation. The, the smooth muscle does not have striation. The cylindrical shape is of skeletal and cardiac. Uninucleated, smooth and cardiac. Fusiform shape, smooth. Then if I say striations in the skeletal and the cardiac. Junctions in the smooth and the cardiac right so this is how you have to learn it fine guys okay i think this is enough for your revision let's move further and talk about the structure of neuron if you'll see the neuron the structure of neuron the entire body is divided into two parts right so one is exon another is cyton like this okay so this portion is cyton and this portion is exon. Fine guys. In cyton you will find a nucleus. You find a very important small small granules. They are known as nizzle granules. These nizzle granules or nizzle bodies. These nizzle granules or nizzle's body. They have ribosomes and RER. Ribosome and RER. What is their function? Their function is protein synthesis. Protein synthesis and they give grey colour. That's why the grey matter in the cerebrum is grey because of this. Now this is uh, wrapped by these cells known as Schwann cell. Which cells? Schwann cell. And Schwann cells secrete white colour sheath known as myelin sheath. And what myelin sheath is made up of? Lipid. It is made up of lipid. It is an insulator. On the ends, axonal bulbs, we have these synaptic vesicles synaptic vesicles which contain neurotransmitter a chemical which contains neurotransmitter fine guys another thing to note here there is a junction that is formed between two neurons what do you call it as synapse what do you call it as synapse so how does one neuron talk with the another one by the release of the chemicals from these synaptic vesicles so always through one synapse the chemicals are released this is how they transmit information from one neuron to the another so that the synapse is a junction between the two neuron fine okay yes you will definitely get the pdf on the pw app don't worry right okay next let's talk about i think we are done with the junction let's start with the biomolecule so this was about the tissues portion uh, the cockroach will be doing in the last okay we'll doing the cockroach in the last all right guys all right so the very very most important thing in biomolecule is this chart of secondary metabolites what are secondary metabolites 
what are secondary metabolites these are all chemicals or substances or biomolecule which are not that much important for the organism so whenever i'm talking about secondary metabolites we are not talking about animals we are talking about plants bacteria fungus but we are not talking about animals now what are the various secondary metabolites here in pigments we have carotenoids and anthocyanins you must have heard of these pigments in the botany so you will never get confused with this one okay then we have alkaloids in alkaloids we have morphine and codeine in alkaloids we have morphine and codeine so learn it with mac morphine codeine alkaloid okay or if you remember in the drugs you must have done that uh, morphine is extracted from latex of the poppy plant and latex are alkaloids latex are what uh, alkaloids then we have terpenoids and terpenoids all the words will be having terpenes at the end monoterpene and diterpene in the essential oil again it has a name oil then comes toxin and lectin in lectin we have concanvalin a we have called concanvalin a you learn it with lac lectin concanvalin a okay and then in the toxin we have in at the last we have in at the last okay or you can learn it with tar t a r toxin abrin and ricin then we have drugs you must have heard of this drug vinblastin it is anti cancerous drug then we have curcumin curcumin is in your uh, haldi or turmeric and it's anti inflammatory fine so then polymeric you all know these all are polymers rubber gum and cellulose okay so that's about uh, your uh, entire secondary metabolites now you have two types of molecules you have bio macro molecules and bio micromolecules bio micromolecules so all the polymers they are in macromolecules like your cellulose is in macro whereas in micro you will get the glucose so here you will get all the monomers right so their uh, molecular weight is less than 800 dalton in bio macromolecule if we talk about that experiment lipid is not a strict macromolecule lipid is not a strict macro molecule not a strict macro molecule okay why because the chemical property does not allow it to get filtered whereas its molecular weight is never more than 800 dalton so according to molecular weight lipid is a micro molecule but according to its chemical property it is a macro molecule all right guys okay moving further to the next let's talk about all the sugars and every bond we are going to talk about now right we'll start with the carbohydrate in carbohydrate if you remember first of all we'll talk about glucose glucose is a monomer it's a monosaccharide it's a simple sugar and which group it have it is the aldose it has aldehyde group every sugar have which groups it has carbonyl group it has carbonyl carbon and it have hydroxyl groups second let's talk about ribose ribose is also aldose and the ring of glucose is pyranose which ring glucose have pyranose which ring which ring uh, ribose have furanose if you take away oh uh, or the o from the second carbon in the ribose it will become deoxyribose fine then third one we have disaccharides very important in disaccharides what do we have first of all we have maltose then we have sucrose and then we have then we have yes guys lactose what are they made up of the maltose is made up of glucose plus glucose and the bonding is alpha 14 the sucrose is made up of glucose plus fructose and the bonding is alpha 12 and it is a non reducing sugar and it is a non reducing sugar because it will not uh, give positive test of felings and benedict fine then we have lactose it is made up of galactose and glucose and the bonding is beta 14 bonding is beta 14 these are disaccharide let's talk about the polymers what polymers in polymers we have starch we have glycogen the most important ones we are talking about we have cellulose and we have chitin and then we have inulin okay these three they are storage sugars they are storage polysaccharide that means they will be stored somehow in the plants okay so let's talk about this one the starch have two components amylose and amylopectin 
right guys amylose is helical one this is the branched one the bonding here is alpha 14 in the straight chain here alpha 14 in the straight chain wherever there is branching that is alpha 16 and what it is made up of the starch is made up of alpha glucose it gives positive test with the iodine or it gives the blue black color with iodine because iodine molecules they trapped in this helical strand then we have the glycogen glycogen is also made up of alpha glucose in the straight chain the bonding is alpha 14 like this right in the branching the uh, the bonding is alpha 16 in the branching the bonding is alpha 16 all right then inulin is also storage but it is made up of fructose and it is present in the family uh, of uh, like atrochoc plant it is present in that right then we have cellulose cellulose and chitin they both are structural polysaccharide they both are structural polysaccharide all these the one which we have done right now they all are homopolymers that means they are all are homopolysaccharide you will be getting only one type of a sugar you will be getting only one type of a sugar fine so here in the cellulose what do we have the cellulose is made up of beta glucose the bonding is beta 14 the bonding is beta 14 okay snega says ma'am go slow guys this is revision so if i go slow it will take your entire day then other subjects you will not be able to revise it's a revision okay all right okay then we have uh, in the cellulose this is also unbranched another question that can be asked is which of this following are branched you will say starch is branch glycogen is branch whereas cellulose this is unbranched if we talk about the chitin what chitin is made up of chitin is made up of nag and acetyl glucosamine and acetyl glucosamine and where it is present in the exoskeleton exoskeleton of arthropods and cell wall of fungi cell wall of fungi fine guys okay just give a look hurry up hurry up hurry up hurry up give a look hurry up hurry up give a look to this yes so the most common question that can be asked from here is about polysaccharides homopolymer heteropolymer and another question that can be asked from this one another question that can be asked from this one is uh, which is structural and which is the storage one fine sitam is saying ma'am thoda hindi mein boliye see sitam i'm really sorry this is a pw english channel and i hope you can understand this much of english this is not uh, you know i'm even i don't know that much of an english ra yaar <laughs> right okay all right so this is about all your uh, uh, polysaccharides let's talk about the another important topic that is your enzymes so if i talk about enzymes what enzymes are made up of enzymes are made up of guys what it is made up of it is made up of protein so which uh, which structure of protein tertiary structure which structure tertiary structure of protein now let's talk about tertiary structure what are the bonds that are present in the tertiary structure first of all it has a peptide chain so the peptide bond will definitely be present okay you know what is a peptide bond the bond which is formed between two amino acid which is formed between two amino acid fine guys next one the bonds that helps in stabilizing hydrogen bonds van der waal forces van der waal forces of attraction hydrophobic bonds covalent bonds like disulfide bonds fine all these bond these one uh, and also your ionic bond these helps in stabilization they help in stabilization or stabilizing the tertiary structure of protein whereas ester bond where do you find the ester bond ester bond is found in lipids one or uh, uh, one common question that can be asked lipids they are not polymers they are esters 
लिपिड्स आर नॉट पॉलीमर्स कार्बोहाइड्रेट्स आर पॉलीमर्स प्रोटीन्स आर पॉलीमर्स न्यूक्लिक एसिड्स आर पॉलीमर्स बट लिपिड्स दे आर नॉट पॉलीमर्स दीज आर दी एस्टर्स ऑफ फैटी एसिड एंड ग्लिसरॉल वी विल टॉकिंग अबाउट देम शॉर्टली फाइन सो लेट्स टॉक अबाउट इंजाइम इंजाइम द एक्सिबिट टर्शरी स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ प्रोटीन एक्सेप्शन आर ऑलवेज देर ऑल इंजाइम्स आर प्रोटीन बट देर इज एन एक्सेप्शन एक्सेप्ट राइबोजाइम्स राइबोजाइम्स आर द इंजाइम्स दैट आर नॉट प्रोटीन्स दे आर रादर आर एन ए they are rna and rna have catalytic properties so they can work exactly like that of the enzymes fine okay then this is how the enzyme work what does enzyme does for example this is a enzyme enzyme have an active site to which the substrate bind both will bind like this both will bind like this and then they will form product they will form product For example, this is sucrose. Sucrose is digested by sucrase and form glucose and fructose. Okay, so here uh, two products are formed and uh, enzyme is released, or the products are released and enzyme is used again. Enzyme is used again. But what enzyme is basically doing? Enzyme is reducing this activation energy. What is activation energy? The energy that you require or you need to reduce or to reduce what? to reduce the rate of reaction or uh, sorry not the rate of reaction to reduce the barrier it's a kind of a barrier that we need to start a chemical reaction it's energy that we need to start a chemical reaction fine so here you can see two graph here we have substrate where we have product so here we have potential energy so here you can see substrate is at higher energy level than the product okay so when there is no enzyme you can see the activation energy barrier that is so much this is the amount of energy you need but when there is enzyme you can see the energy barrier has been reduced so this is what enzyme is doing how does enzyme catalyze it enzyme reduces the activation energy barrier so in this reaction you can see the substrate is at higher energy level than the product that means substrate had a lot of energy but when it gets converted into product it loses its energy so it's a type of exothermic reaction exothermic reaction fine if the substrate would be at higher uh, at the lower energy level and product would have been at the higher energy level then this reaction would have been the endothermic reaction which reaction guys endothermic right okay so this is how guys the enzyme work let's talk about let's talk about one most important topic one most important topic cofactors so holo enzyme is technically the complete enzyme holo enzyme is technically the complete enzyme so it is made up of apo enzyme apo enzyme is a protein part of the enzyme and second the cofactors cofactors are always non protein part first of all sometimes this basic question can also be asked about this formula right so though zoology do not have a lot of formulas so this one is here holo enzyme is equal to apo enzyme plus cofactor apo enzyme is a protein part because apo have p in it so it's a protein part and the other left cofactor is a non protein part now this cofactors guys they are of three types how many types three types the one the one is your yes prosthetic group prosthetic group the second one is your coenzyme and third one is your metal ions out of these they are loosely bonded to protein part they will only bind they will only bind to the protein part whenever necessary so basically vitamin niacin the vitamin b3 it is a kind of coenzyme it has some structure in them that is nad and nadp nad and nadp they bind to the protein part that is apo enzyme so vitamins they are also having nad and nadp in them nad and nadp in them and that is a molecule that attaches to the apo enzyme fine guys okay then we have prosthetic group it is tightly bonded it is tightly bonded the coenzyme they are usually organic molecules they are what organic molecules so here we have like heme heme is a portion that is used in the enzyme like catalase peroxidase fine whereas metal ions they are ions like zinc zinc is a cofactor for carboxypeptidase it's a cofactor for carboxypeptidase 
all right okay so this is the most important one you can just have a look on it hurry up you can have a look on it guys then we'll go further with another topics hurry up hurry up hurry up so this is the most important one please have a look on it yes okay 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 all right done done let's talk about these structures now let's talk about these structures now let's talk about these structures now so the first structure we have are your sugars these are sugars so which sugar is this glucose another is ribose so you all know about ribose because you have done it in your botany also in molecular basis of inheritance fine if you talk about this uh, six carbon one it's glucose and this is a pyranose ring so have a look on it okay then we have these amino acid glycine alanine and serine the basic structure of amino acid is always same for all the amino acid okay for example this structure will always be there in entire amino acid the only difference will be on the r chain okay if the amino acids r chain have nh2 it's basic if the r chain have oh it's alcoholic if it has extra coh it's acidic if it has sulfur it is sulfur containing and if it has any ring it is aromatic this is how you can identify for example this is a structure of serine if i know the alcoholic ones have oh in them and the examples of alcoholic is serine and threonine i can easily guess the structure is of serine right you can also make guesses there if you do not know the structure of the entire amino acid talking about the basic we have lysine and we have arginine talking about the acidic one we have glutamic acid and aspartic acid in sulfur one we have methionine and cysteine and in the aromatic one we have phenyl alanine we have tryptophan and we have tyrosine okay guys now what about these ones the one which do not have any of these functional group just have rather ch3 ch or just h they are your neutral amino acid in neutral we have gavel glycine alanine valine isoleucine and leucine okay so here the simplest amino acid is uh, glycine which have only h the one with ch3 is alanine all you have to focus on are basically these three amino acid and the one which are which were given in the previous ncrt the glutamic acid right and the tyrosine in tyrosine the group will be like this it will be a ring and in the ring there will be oh present this will be your tyrosine if the r group is like this it will be your it will be your tyrosine okay guys all right next structure we have is of palmitic acid can you see the palmitic acid if this if this image is not clear you can also open your ncrt books i hope you all have it right in palmitic acid how will you identify it will be the r chain associated with coh so in how many total carbon will be there in palmitic acid including coh then it will be 16 so in the lipids if we'll see the palmitic acid have 16 carbon steric acid have 18 carbon 18 carbon whereas another is arachidonic acid arachidonic acid have how many carbons guys 20 carbons then we have this structure known as glycerol glycerol and fatty acid they will together they will uh, do the reaction they will do the sterification and form a lipid so glycerol is this glycerol is uh, trihydroxypropane what is the other name of glycerol trihydroxypropane then we have this triglyceride this is the structure that uh, uh, you should know let me just draw it for you guys so this was your glycerol so it gets esterified with the first uh, your chain fatty acid this is how it will look like then right c double bond o r2 and then we have ch2o c double bond o r3 this is how triglyceride looks like 
okay so one common question that can be asked from here how many glycerol do we need to make a triglyceride we need only one glycerol and how many fatty acid three fatty acids so most of you gets confused because there are three fatty acid there will be three glycerol no one glycerol have three oh groups so why does it needs this three glycerol it already have three oh to esterify or do esterification with three fatty acid fine guys so here we have one glycerol and three fatty acid to make one triglyceride next is another important structure that is of a phospholipid how will you identify the structure it will be also having a triglyceride structure in it it will be having glycerol one fatty acid second fatty acid okay second fatty acid then a phosphate then this group known as choline so this is the structure of lecithin lecithin is a phospholipid lecithin is a phospholipid so what group does lecithin have it has a group known as choline fine okay then this is a structure of cholesterol so if you have this tough ring like structure and on the one hand it has oh group and on the other hand it has the chains like this it will be cholesterol just close your eyes and mark it okay so if the structure comes it has a number of rings on one side it has oh on the other hand it has this uh, uh, a half ring form not a complete ring then it is a structure of cholesterol okay then comes to the uh, your nucleic acid what are nucleic acids made up of nucleic acids are made up of yes let's see nucleotides so dna for example it's a nucleic acid so enzyme that digest nucleic acid are nucleases so pancreatic juice have nucleases dnas and rnas okay so nucleic acid is made up of nucleotide and nucleotide is made up of nucleoside plus phosphate and nucleoside is made up of nitrogenous base plus sugar in case of rna the sugar is ribose and in case of dna the sugar is deoxyribose okay so in shortcut we can also say the nucleotide is made up of nitrogenous base sugar and phosphate what are the nitrogenous bases we have we have purine we have pyrimidine this is what we have fine in the purine in the purine we have double cyclic structures purines will always be have two cyclic structure one is adenine another is guanine in the pyrimidine we have only one cyclic structure that means there will be only one ring we have uracil we have thymine we have cytosine the uracil is found in rna right you will never get uracil in the dna reason is because this ribose sugar is compatible with uracil deoxyribose is compatible with thymine okay now what are the bonds present here when a sugar on the first carbon binds with the base for example adenine the bond form is a glycosidic bond so what bond makes a nucleoside you will say glycosidic so here on the fifth carbon there is a fifth carbon on fifth carbon will be phosphate present and the bond is phosphoester whereas similar type of a structure will be present above it which will be forming another nucleotide here you will be having oh here also you will be having oh for a phosphate then the water will be released and a bond will be formed between two nucleotide and this bond is phosphodiester so if someone ask you what bond is formed between two nucleotide you will be saying phosphodiester bond between two nucleotide phosphodiester bond is formed okay so now let's imagine you got a structure to identify of any nitrogenous base let's see what are the various structures present here so first of all if the structure is cyclic and it is single cyclic it will be uracil it will be uracil it if has if it has double bond o on its upper side and no methyl group anywhere okay if it is double cyclic and if it has nh2 group here and nh here it will be adenine as i've told you the uh, double cyclics are always purine and single cyclics are pyrimidine half of the work is done okay then what about these structures so for example you can see here the sugar is ribose and uracil is present there is no phosphate attached so it is a nucleoside it is a nucleoside but what is the name of a nucleoside of uracil it is a uridine so because uracil is a pyrimidine and pyrimidine have din in them so all its nucleosides will be having din in them 
it will be having din in them okay and then we have adenine adenine is a purine they will be having sin in them so this is the most common question that can be asked about its uh, name of nucleoside and nucleotide then if it has a phosphate in it because it's a phosphoric acid so everything be, uh, any word which has acid in them that will be a nucleotide that will be a nucleotide so you have to see what other things are present here here you do not see any or you cannot see any phosphate so it's a nucleoside and this one is a nucleotide fine so what are the names of the various nucleosides and tide if it is adenine what will be the name of a nucleoside guys you have to tell me Yes, you have to tell me. It's your revision. I'm not just teaching. I'm revising things up here. Tell me, yes, who who are here? Yes. Hurry up, hurry up. Let me know. Yes. What will be the name of the adenine, uh, nucleoside of adenine? Anyone? anyone yes very good money very good the name will be adenosine and what will be the name of nucleotide adenylic acid so nucleotides are easy to uh, you know guess because they have acid in them what about uh, the guanine it will be guanosine what about the uracil uridine what about the cytosine cytidin and what about the thymine thymidin okay that's about your uh, nucleic acids and uh, your biomolecules so in biomolecules these were the most most important topics bonds are very important what type of structure form which type of a bond Wh uh, what type of a bond lipids form ester what type of a bond proteins form peptide what type of a bond carbohydrates form glycosidic what type of a bond is formed in nucleic acid phosphodiester bond okay all right all right very nice very nice okay bhavya Yes, 12th will also be discussed today. 12th class revision will also be done here, right? Okay, then we have in the digestion and absorption, the most important topic, glands and the enzyme. So, we'll start from the mouth. In the mouth, what gland do we have? We have salivary gland, guys. So, how many pairs of salivary glands we have? We have three pairs. We have three pairs. Okay, just touch here. You have parroted here. Okay, then you have here on the jaw submaxillary submandibular and beneath the tongue sublingual lingua word is used for language and language or speaking is done by the tongue so sublingual below the tongue okay so here what does salivary gland produce it produces saliva and saliva or salivary gland is also a source of excretory secondary excretory organ because it excrete a very small amount of urea so do not forget it also secrete the small amount of urea excretion and that excretory products and elimination chapter okay so it produces saliva and saliva have alpha salivary amylase what does it digest it digest starch how much starch 30 percent starch so 30 percent of starch digestion takes place in the salivary gland what's the ph of saliva pH is 6.8. Fine. Okay. So, if someone asks you where does the digestion of carbohydrates start, you will say in the mouth. Then, moving down in esophagus, you have no glands. We have glands in the stomach and they are gastric glands. Can anyone tell me what's the pH of the gastric glands, guys? What is the pH of gastric glands? No one knows. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. No one knows what is the pH of gastric glands, acidic, alkaline, how much, what's the exact value, no one knows. So, what's the function of stomach? It stores, it stores food. It has gastric glands, it has number of cells. It has number of cells. What are the cells? Very good, 1.8 pH, very nice. What are the cells it has? Chief cells, also known as peptic cell. Okay, parietal cell, also known as auxentic cell. So, most of you get... Uh, Confused in this. OP, you used to, uh, nowadays it's very common among students. OP, overpowered, right? Like uh, some students say, Diksha ma'am, OP, right? PWOP, fine. So OP is overpowered. So who is overpowered here? HCL. So auxentic cell or parietal cell, they secrete HCL because HCL is giving acidic 
medium so it produces hcl and castles intrinsic factor and what is the purpose of castles intrinsic factor its function is vitamin b12 absorption vitamin b12 absorption then we have chief cell or peptic cell what do they secrete they secrete inactive form of enzyme like pepsinogen and they also secrete renin and very small amount of lipase renin has a role in milk protein digestion milk protein digestion what is the name of milk protein casein and uh, the pepsinogen's function is digestion of proteins okay then we have the cells g cell and g cell secrete gastrin hormone which hormone guys gastrin hormone so what is the function of this gastrin hormone its function is to increase the secretion of the stomach and its motility and if you remember the uh, elementary canal will be doing the structure of elementary canal the stomach have additional layer of layer of the oblique muscles okay then the last cell mucus cell or goblet cell sometimes they are also known as like neck cells or surface cells they are goblet cells only and they secrete mucus why because the ph is around 1.8 it's highly acidic we want to protect it fine guys okay so that's about your glands in the stomach let's talk about the pancreas now pancreas third gland is pancreas fourth is your liver okay we'll talk about liver later so if i talk about the pancreas the secretion is quite alkaline about 8.4 to 8.6 ph what are the secretion in pancreatic juice you will see sodium bicarbonate water so wherever sodium bicarbonate is there in the secretion the secretion will be alkaline in nature it will be alkaline then what are the various enzyme the enzyme it secretes is first of all nucleases in nucleases are the one that that uh, digest nucleic acid dnas and rnas fine then we have amylase pancreatic i am writing p that means pancreatic pancreatic amylase is also known as amylopsin it is also known as amylopsin 70% of starch digestion takes place by this okay then we have pancreatic lipase also known as tapsin it helps in digestion of lipid then we have enzyme to digest protein which are inactive trypsinogen chymotrypsinogen and procarboxypeptidase procarboxypeptidase fine guys okay if someone ask you which gland have uh, have all the enzyme or the complete gland which helps in digestion of all the food particles then you will say it's pancreas because it has uh, it has every type of enzyme to digest every type of food whether it is nucleic acid whether it is the carbohydrate whether it is the lipid or if it is a protein so they help in protein digestion these all are inactive so they can be activated by enterokinase so trypsinogen will be activated into trypsin by enterokinase and enterokinase comes from small intestine it's a part of succus entericus it's a part of succus entericus this one they are activated by trypsin and also once the trypsin is activated it can also activate trypsinogen all right that's about your pancreas guys in pancreas this is the exocrine portion in the endocrine portion of pancreas pancreas also have endocrine portion there are two or three types of self, uh, cells alpha beta and gamma alpha secretes glucagon beta secretes insulin which is the hormone and this one delta secretes somatostatin okay alpha increases blood glucose so it is hyperglycemic beta or insulin uh, beta secretes insulin and it decreases the uh, blood glucose so it is hypoglycemic whereas somatostatin inhibit both of them because they both are fighting glucagon wants to increase the blood sugar and this one wants to decrease the blood sugar so both are fighting somatostatin when inhibited so what are the things they are doing to decrease the blood sugar or increase the blood sugar glucagon will make sure no cell will pick up the glucose and insulin will make sure all the cells will contain glucose 
right because if the glucose gets inside the cell its concentration in the blood will be low so that's why insulin is performing this function with the help of glut glut are what glucose transporters it is helping in the uh, movement of glucose inside the cells okay guys okay then let's move further and talk about the other things that means liver if we talk about liver and pancreas and the location let's talk about that first if this is a liver and uh, this is the duodenum duodenum is a c shape first part of small intestine and this is your pancreas this is what your pancreas okay so there are two ducts one is a left duct another is a right duct that is coming from liver forming a common hepatic duct so the liver ducts will always be uh, named after hepato hepati and all these hepato what is always used for liver liver is the largest endocrine uh, sorry not endocrine is the largest gland of your body it's a largest gland not endocrine largest endocrine is thyroid okay so it's the largest uh, gland of your body and this one does not produce any enzyme it does not produce any enzyme you heard it right no enzymes are secreted by liver so it does not play any role in the digestion of anything it uh, helps in in direct digestion okay guys next moving further so this liver uh, it has common hepatic duct the function of liver is it produces bile another thing to note down here is that or to learn here is that liver has a power of regeneration if some of the cells are damaged in liver it can regenerate it can be formed new okay then uh, we have a small structure present behind the liver that is gall bladder the function of gall bladder that it will store and concentrate bile it will store and concentrate bile okay who secretes bile or which gland secretes bile liver who concentrate it and store it that is gall bladder so here the common uh, hepatic duct and the duct of your gall bladder they are going to join and they are going to find form a common duct which is a common bile duct common bile duct so common bile duct is going to unite with the duct of with the duct of pancreas it is going to unite with the ducts of pancreas and together together they are forming the common hepatic or you can say the hepato pancreatic duct so what duct is that hepato pancreatic duct and what is the name of our duct of your gallbladder this one this is a cystic duct so whenever cck cholecystokinin hormone whenever cc uh, uh, whenever the cck comes it will cause a contraction of cystic duct and this is how cystic duct will uh, pour out the bile from it okay so one hormone that helps in the release of bile from the uh, your gallbladder that is cck another function performed by cck that it increases the function of secretin which is another hormone which helps in secretion of pancreatic juice okay guys okay so hepato pancreatic duct is guarded by a sphincter which is known as sphincter of ordi and sphincter of ordi is guarding which duct hepato pancreatic duct and where does it it is opening it is opening in the duodenum so this is the sphincter of ordi Okay guys this is important so from here the questions can be asked all right just take a look hurry up take a look guys so uh, some people are doing chat here do you have a lot of time for chit chat here tomorrow you have an exam yes how are you feeling about exam let me know how are you feeling about uh, exam yes nervous or excited nervous or excited how is that feeling no feeling at all oh you don't you don't need to be nervous guys no 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 nothing just be focused there on exam so while you are in the examination hall na do not think about anything you know some students what do they do they they declare themselves you know defeated in the examination hall only so they will never never succeed i tell you so if in the exam you think yeah i have these 3 or a 3 and a half hours and i'll just focus there i'll i'll try to solve the question i'll try to revise things whatever i have done or i'll try to remind or remember things 
then all your energies will be focused on uh, you know remembering all those things and you will be able to solve the question but once you tell your mind you know whatever you tell your mind it will do the things so that same things only so but if you tell your mind no 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 i can crack it in fact i can get 100% score in biology so if the 100% score is there in the biology others can easily be balanced right later on so you can easily crack it but if you tell your mind that no it's tough i have not revised or this and that you will never be able to do it whenever you go with a cool mind in the exam you will definitely do best in that remember my one thing if you feel cool before the exam and if you feel like yes i have revised it and i trust myself i have given my enough and yeah there will be questions and i'll solve because i have seen the those all if you have seen the sphincter of order and if it it comes in exam what's the deal but do not overthink in the biology exam if you think you have read this line in the ncrt and that's the answer just go for it do not overthink in the biology exam okay just trust yourself guys and stay calm just trust yourself you nothing else you have to do just trust yourself if you do not trust yourself who will then right who will you know now you have done your hard work you know now you have uh, uh, you know uh, burned the midnight oil and you have uh, read everything so nicely and everything then what's the first you don't have to think anything uh, else you don't have to be negative you have to believe in the power of attraction more positive you think more positive things will come to you so just stay positive stay calm and whatever you have done just put it out that on the exam okay and don't feel nervousness and nothing like that okay guys okay okay no worries next move let's move further and talk about the succus entericus the intestinal juice intestinal juice or succus entericus it is also alkaline the food which is present in the stomach is acidic and you call it as chyme and the one which is alkaline is chyle chyle is alkaline food alkaline have l in it acidic doesn't have l in it so the one with the l is your alkaline food okay now what about the glands intestinal glands crypts of libercoon so these are the villi villi are present in the small intestine to increase the surface area the th the spaces present between the them between them they are crypts of libercoon they have various types of cells like this okay so one such cell is a penet cell Another type of a cell is argentafin cell and these cells argentafin cells these are endocrine cells they secrete the hormones like cck and secretin you know the function of secretin uh, and cck cck helps in the contraction of duct cystic duct of gallbladder so c for cystic c for cck cystic is a duct of gallbladder okay so that the bile could come out then secretin what about the secretin it goes to the pancreas and tell pancreas to secrete its enzyme and then we have penet cell and here we have mucus cell mucus cell secretes mucus because the food that will come from uh, the what do you say stomach it is uh, quite acidic so we also need mucus here so penet cell it secrete enzymes it also secrete lysozyme which is antibacterial and it can also undergo phagocytosis so do not forget this it penet cell it also undergoes phagocytosis if there are certain uh, you know uh, bacteria or something like that right then we have enzymes what enzymes does penet cell secrete that's a part of succus entericus let's get started we have sucrase we have maltase we have lactase fine we have dipeptidase we have uh, amino peptidase right guys then we have Uh, the nucleotidase nucleosidase and lipase and lipase fine okay so these are the various enzyme now let's dig inside the villi what do we have in villi in villi we have blood vessels we have arteries we have veins and we have capillaries and we have capillaries all these things are there but inside that is present another vessel which is a lymph vessel you call it as lactile 
lactyl is a lymph vessel and what's the function of a lymph vessel it helps in the absorption of fat the fat molecules are not absor uh, absorbed directly into the blood why because in the blood they may get deposited and it can cause diseases fine so lactyl is the one which is a lymph vessel and that absorbs fat that absorbs fat okay all right so just have a look hurry up please everyone do not uh, pay attention to what the people are writing in the chat all you have to do is to revise whatever we are doing here because tomorrow then you will think ma'am oh ma'am have told this if if it comes in exam right all right all right just do it give give it a quick look guys hurry up all right all right okay all right next let's talk about let's uh, let's talk about the further things here in the digestion chapter so another thing is about the transport how does the molecules transport so one such transport is active transport another such transport is a simple diffusion which is passive transport and third one is facilitated third one is facilitated third one is facilitated okay glucose can be transported by all these means by all these means in fact along with that amino acid they can be transported by all these three means okay whereas potassium ions they can go by simple diffusion sodium ions need the uh, active transport for the movement and fructose it also need facilitated transport f4 fructose f4 facilitated what's facilitated when we need small uh, carrier proteins for movement all right guys so this is what it is written in ncert imagine there is a question which of the following uh, gets uh, transported by active transport and the option is like you have fructose you have glucose and then you have other things then what will you mark it's true glucose goes by active transport then you can mark glucose there okay guys yes yes this is what it is written in ncert this is what i'm telling you in crux okay then let's move further to the another topic what does bile do bile does bile have an enzyme no enzymes are present in bile so in bile we do not have an enzyme then what does bile does bile activates the lipase lipase is an enzyme to uh, which helps in digestion of the fat and third thing it does is it helps in emulsification emulsification of fat that means it will break large molecule into the smaller ones why the smaller ones because uh, if you break them into smaller molecule this is what digestion does digestion is a mechanical and biochemical process in mechanical you are breaking the molecule in biochemical you are using the enzymes also okay so here you are breaking the small molecule so that there is more surface area for the en enzyme actions so small molecules if the molecules are small there will be more surface area for enzyme action for enzyme action okay all right so that's about uh, your uh, uh, digestion process here and about the fats let's talk uh, further about another glands one gland we have is a bruner's gland where is bruner's gland present it is present in submucosa in which submucosa in the submucosa of duodenum what does it secrete alkaline mucus now let's talk about all the layers of your alimentary canal the outermost layer of alimentary canal is your everyone serosa so what does serosa is made up of serosa is made up of epithelium plus connective tissue together you call it as mesothelium what do you call it as mesothelium so serosa is the outermost layer and it is made up of mesothelium fine then inside you have lumen where food is present and here we have mucosal epithelium so let's just uh, talk about the muscular layer first uh, then after serosa we have a layer of muscles outer longitudinal outer longitudinal and inner circular outer longitudinal and inner circular 
so this is a muscularis portion this is a muscular coat in muscular coat outer longitudinal learn it with ol and inner circular i c inner circular okay and then you have the layer known as submucosa in this submucosa of duodenum you have this gland known as bruner's gland okay whereas additional oblique muscle layer is present in stomach apart from all these stomach also have oblique muscle why because stomach have to do a function of churning of food mixing of food so for gastric motility we need a lot of muscle that's why your uh, stomach have additional layer of uh, these muscle known as oblique muscle then we have this layer known as mucosa mucosa is present in the form of rugae in stomachs rugae are what they are for, uh, folds again a fold are also present in the small intestine you call it as villi so if someone ask you what are the folds uh, known as rugae present in the stomachs they are made up of these are nothing they are the folds of mucosa similarly the folds present in the small intestine are villi and they are also the folds of mucosa is that clear yes yes everyone is that clear this is what your uh, uh, layers from outside to inside so the most often question that can be asked here is tell the sequence of layers from inside to outside or outside to inside so if we'll talk about outside to inside serosa muscularis submucosa and mucosa and mucosa have a lot of glands in it what does mucosa have mucosa have a lot of glands so this is the one that produces glands Okay, so that's about the layers. Well, uh, guys, let's have a look on it. Let's have a look on it. Then we'll discuss uh, the teeth. Then we'll discuss the teeth. Yes. Okay, let's talk about the teeth then. In teeth, what type of dentition we have? We have diaphyodont. What is diaphyodont? That means teeth appear twice in life. Once it was a milk teeth. And another when it was a permanent teeth. Right? Milk teeth are also known as deciduous because they get fall off. So the dental formula is 2102 by 2102 into 2. And the dental formula is 2123, 2123 into 2. Okay. This is incisor, canine, premolar, and molar. This is for the lower jaw. This is for the upper jaw. Why are you multiplying with 2? Because we want to add both the sides. Okay. Then another type is thecodon dentition. The teeth are embedded on the, in the sockets. So if you'll see the teeth, this portion of the teeth is root. And root is embedded in your bone like this, which is covered by gums, which is covered by gums. So how many roots does different types of teeth have? So another type of dentition we have is heterodont. There I'll be discussing the number of roots, which is important because it's also given in NCRT. Okay, it's mentioned in the form of diagram. Here we have another uh, different types of teeth. Such kind of dentition is heterodont. Incisors, canines, premolars and molars. So these have one root, incisor and canines. Whereas premolar have two root in the upper jaw one root in their lower jaw premolars have three roots in the upper jaw and two roots in the lower jaw fine this is how it is because it's also it, there is a diagram uh, given in the ncrt okay all right so that's about the dentition another type of dentition we have is bunodont bunodont means your teeth have these low cusp that's what the bunodont is fine next Let's talk about, uh, okay, so we have already done about the dentition. Let's talk about the another last important thing, disorders. Do not forget disorders. One of the questions will be definitely be there from diseases or disorders, okay? More than one, in fact. The inflammation of the intestinal tract is the most common ailment due to bacterial or viral infection. So, yes, you can get the inflammation. Sometimes it is also known as colitis and colitis is autoimmune. Inflammation in colon, it's autoimmune. Okay, then infections can also be caused by parasite like your escalmenthes and par uh, your flatworms. Jaundice, the liver is infected, skin and eyes turn yellow due to the deposit of bile pigment. Which pigment is deposited in the jaundice? Bilirubin. That's why the eyes appear yellow in color. So large intestine, large intestine 
as portion known as cologne. So if cologne gets inflated, it is known as colitis. Okay. So here uh, in the large intestine, the feces are formed. The yellow brown color to the fe feces is also given by your pigment bilirubin. So if in the uh, if liver is infected, that bilirubin gets deposited in your uh, skin, in your eyes, and they appear yellow. Vomiting, ejection of stomach content. So from where you get vomiting, all your content in the stomach, it will move out. That's vomiting. And reflect, it's a kind of a reflex action and it comes from medulla. A feeling of nausea precedes vomiting. So whenever before vomiting, you have a feel of vomiting, you call it as nausea. Okay. Then you have diarrhea and constipation. Most of the student gets confused in diarrhea and constipation. So in the diarrhea, we have abnormal frequency of bowel movements. In constipation, the feces are retained in the colon. They remain in the colon for longer time. Why? Because there are irregular bowel movements. They were uh, like, for example, today the bowel movements are there nicely. Tomorrow it will not be like that. Okay. So the frequency is less. Here the frequency is more. As a result, the bowel movements are not able to retain in the intestine and the water is not absorbed. So whatever feces are there, they are with more water. So you call it as diarrhea, liquidity of feces. Fine. It reduces absorption of food because the feces are not or the food is not re retained there for longer duration. So here in digestion, in this condition, the food is not properly digested, leading to the feeling of fullness. For example, right now, you some of you must be feeling this. Like your mom must be saying, eat something. So you'll say, no, I'm not in a mood of eating. Why? Because you are a little nervous for the exam. Fine. The cause of indigestion are inadequate enzyme secretion. It can be because you don't have enzyme, anxiety, food poisoning, overeating and spicy food. But you don't have to be nervous. It's exam. You have done it well, you have uh, uh, you have revised everything well, then why to worry, right guys? Okay, so that's about all the disorder. Two disorders that we have, one is quashi or core. This is the disorders of malnutrition. Another is merasmus. In marasmus, there is a deficiency of both, uh, both calories and protein. Marasmus, in Hindi you say marahua. That means it has no calories, no proteins, nothing is given to such kind of a people. In kwashi or kor, there is less proteins or deficiency of proteins. Fine. In kwashi or kor, you will see the condition known as edema. And in the marasmus, there will be prominent ribs. Other... Uh, uh, prominent ribs and dry skin other kind of symptom like wasting of limbs and muscles will be same in both quash yorker and marasmus okay guys very simple all right so that's about the disorder let's talk about large intestine and we'll finish this chapter then in large intestine we have colon and colon is divided into how many parts guys four parts ascending colon transverse descending sigmoid curve rectum and anus fine so what are the how many in how many parts the colon is divided four parts the ascending colon the transverse colon the descending colon and the sigmoid colon four parts here we have a portion known as cecum in cecum the ileum enters and there is a valve known as ileocecal valve so that there is no backflow of the fe uh, feces Cecum is blind sac and it is a house for a lot of microorganism. What microorganisms are these? Symbiotic microorganisms. So all these microorganisms, they are symbiotic. They, they live in your body rent free. Fine. So that's uh, the anus and rectum, which is the largest portion. Uh, that is the rectum. Largest portion is always the rectum. Fine, guys. So, that's about your uh, chapter, digestion and absorption. So, we'll start with the breathing and exchange of gases shortly. We'll take a break of around 10 minutes and I'll see you after 10 minutes. Let's have a break of 10 minutes. I'll put a timer here. Okay. Let's have a break of 10 minutes.
All right, guys. So I hope you can hear me. If my voice is clear, please give me thumbs up. If my voice is clear, please give me thumbs up, everyone. Please give me thumbs up. Yes. Can you hear me, guys? Can you hear me? All right. All right. All right. Okay. So let's get started with this chapter: breathing and exchange of gases. So first of all, the disorders are very important from this chapter. So we are starting from there only. Okay. So the first thing, the first disorder we have is asthma. So what is asthma? Three disorders are important: asthma, emphysema, and occupational respiratory disorder. If someone asks you, what's uh, in which disorder does bronchi and bronchioles get infected? Then what will you say? Bronchi and bronchioles get infected. Then what will you say, guys? Yes. Bronchi and bronchioles. Then it will be. Then it will be what? Then it will be your. Asthma. In asthma, it's basically an allergy. So it's a difficulty in breathing causing wheezing. Wheezing means that sound production. Whenever you, uh, for example, whenever uh, you are having cough or so, you all sometimes there is a wheezing sound, right? So there is inflammation of bronchi and bronchiole. Now emphysema is a chronic disorder. Chronic means that can be fatal later on. Uh, disorder in which alveolar walls are damaged. So here it is a lower respiratory tract disease. Okay, uh, in which respiratory surface is decreased or respiratory surface area or the area for the exchange of gases. Any of these uh, things can be used in the exam is decreased. One of the major major cause is cigarette smoking. In asthma we have allergy from dust. In emphysema we are smoker. That's why we got it. Okay. Then in occupational respiratory disease in certain industries, especially those involving grinding or stone breaking, so much dust is produced that the defense mechanism of the body cannot fully cope up with the situation. For example, someone is uh, working in glass factory, so that person can get silicosis where silica is exposed. Long exposure can give rise to inflammation, leading to fibrosis. So fibrosis means inflammation in the wall, and then it later got uh, there is a destruction in the fibers due to which the fibrous tissue it proliferates. That means it expands, fine, and thus causing serious lung damage. Workers in such industry should wear protective masks. If the word is used, inflammation in bronchi and bronchioles, asthma. Alveolar walls damage, damage decrease in surface area for exchange of gases. That is emphysema. If it is fibrosis, then it is occupational respiratory disorders. Fine, guys. Okay. Next, moving further to the most other most important topic, breathing. So, what are the muscles of inspiration, and uh, how does volume increase or decrease? Let's talk about it. Whenever we are inhaling normally, at that time, two muscles are used: external intercostal. plus diaphragm the other name of diaphragm muscle is phrenic muscle and there is increase in volume decrease in pressure because if there is decrease in pressure inside the lung there will be more pressure outside air will move in fine and there is decrease in pressure or change in pressure in all the pressure it can be intrapulmonary it can be thoracic it can be interpleural pressure as well what is a pleura Pleura is the outermost covering on the lungs. It is outermost covering, covering double membrane bag-like structure on the lungs. Fine. In expiration, when if it is normal expiration, all muscles relax. Whatever muscles of inspiration have been contracted, they will relax. As a result, what will happen? There will be decrease in volume, increase in pressure, more pressure inside, less pressure outside. Air will move out. But if someone is undergoing forceful inhalation, at that time internal intercostal muscle and abdominal muscles they play an important role. Okay, this is about uh, the breathing, the in and out. Is it clear, guys? Yes. Okay. Then next one. Next we have a very important one: pulmonary volumes and capacity. First, that we have is a tidal volume. TV. The value of tidal volume is five hundred. It is normal five hundred mL. It is normal in and out. Right now, what you are doing is you are taking normal 
tidal volume that means 500 ml in and 500 ml outside so whenever you are forcefully inspiring whenever you are forcefully inspiring you are taking extra amount of air that is inspiratory reserve volume that is around 2500 to 3000 ml guys this is the most often question asked in the exam definitely they will ask either in any of the form either in the form of capacity or the values or the sim simple the definition this is the extra air taken extra in that means for example i am inhaling forcefully inside during this time i am get i am taking in tv plus irv that is inspiratory capacity that is inspiratory capacity so inspiratory capacity is equal to tv plus irv okay right next then we have expiratory capacity erv expiratory capacity but for that uh, we have to learn first expiratory reserve volume in expiratory reserve volume its value is less than the residual volume so you will always get confused between the values of residual volume and expiratory reserve so remember it is less than than the residual one okay so it is around 1000 to 1100 ml so this is the extra you take out during forceful exhalation right now I take out forcefully exhaling I'm exhaling forcefully at that time I'm also exhaling TV I'm also exhaling ERV so that is my expiratory capacity expiratory capacity is equal to ERV plus TV so if the definition based question has been asked at that time if they're using the word total amount it is definitely capacity if they are just using the word volume then it is a volume and if they are using the word additional volume or extra volume then it will be a reserve in the reserve one they always use the word extra or additional in the capacities they always use the word total okay then uh, then we have the residual volume what is a residual volume for example you are forcefully exhaling you're putting all your effort Despite of putting all the effort, some amount of air, around 1200 ml amount of air, always remain inside the lung, that is your residual volume. So whenever you are forcefully exhaling, forcefully exhaling, the air remains in the lung is residual volume. But whenever you are normally inhale, exhaling, when you are, whenever you are normally exhaling, what will go out? TV. What is inside? ERV is there. So total is FRC, functional residual capacity. Whenever you are normally inhaling or normally exhaling, sorry. Whenever you are normally exhaling, what is present inside the lung is FRC. When you are forcefully exhaling, so when you will be exhaling forcefully, then you will be taking out TV, also ERV. Then whatever remains in the lung is RV. Forcefully exhaling, remain in the lung, residual volume. Normally exhaling, remains in the lung. That is your functional residual capacity. All right. What is vital capacity then? In vital capacity, we add ERV, TV plus IRV. Okay. Then what is TLC? Total lung capacity. Total lung capacity is total amount of air in the lungs when you forcefully inhale. So here you will be having all the airs together or you can also say vital capacity plus residual volume all right guys yes this is what your uh, capacities are just give a look on this chart before the exam okay all right then we have is another topic from here oxygen dissociation curve another topic that we have from here is oxygen dissociation curve all right so imagine this is oxygen dissociation curve the very simple question that can be asked uh, in this curve, wh what are the things that we are plotted against? We are here using the partial pressure of oxygen and percent saturation of hemoglobin. Yes, these kind of questions can also be asked, so do not underestimate. Okay, so here it is sigmoid. What is the shape of the curve? Sigmoid or S shape. Next, when 50% of the hemoglobin gets saturated, that partial pressure is known as pre-50 value that is p50 so here 50 percent of hemoglobin is saturated okay now certain conditions can move this curve it can shift it shift it to the right side or to the left side 
in the left shift left shift imagine this is a good shift and right is a bad shift because in the right shift there is dissociation of the oxyhemoglobin and in the left shift there is association of the oxyhemoglobin Fine guys, so here there is the dissociation of oxyhemoglobin, there is association of the oxyhemoglobin. Now what are these factors? Here increase in partial pressure of CO2, increase in H positive ion, decrease in pH, increase in temperature and increase in BPG. All these can cause right shift. Opposite to here, increase in partial pressure of oxygen, decrease in partial pressure of CO2, decrease in H positive ion or increase in pH, decrease in temperature or decrease in BPG. They causes the left shift. So if someone asks you, where will you find left shift or right shift? I am giving you option alveoli and tissues. Right shift is seen usually near the tissues because they are using oxygen and producing CO2. So the amount of CO2 is more there. Whereas in the alveoli, you will always find the left shift. Right? Just give a look. Hurry up. Give a look to this one, guys. Just have a look of this one. Then we'll move further. Yes. Then we'll move further. Hurry up. Just have a, just, uh, have a look of this one. Yes. Okay. Then moving further to the transport of gases, how much oxygen is transported? 70% in the form of oxyhemoglobin and around uh, your, uh, sorry, 97% in the form of oxyhemoglobin and the less 30, uh, sorry, <laughs> left 3% is dissolved form in plasma. Okay, so this direct question can also be asked, right, uh, about oxygen. How does oxygen is transported? 97% with the hemoglobin and 3% with plasma. About CO2, CO2, what about CO2, right, you know, or you forget about it. 7%, 7% in the plasma, 20 to 25%, 20 to 25%. With hemoglobin as carb amino hemoglobin and rest 70% in the form of bicarbonate ions. In the form of bicarbonate ions. Okay. So whenever you are near the tissues at that time, near the tissues, the concentration of CO2 is more. Whenever uh, we are near the tissues, what will happen with the CO2 which is more? CO2 in the RBC will join with the water and it will form carbonic acid and later on it will be forming H positive and bicarbonate ions and this is how it is formed and what is that enzyme it is present in the RBC the name is carbonic anhydrase and the last portion which is very important here is your regulation regulation the regulation of breathing is done by various ways we have center first of all we have respiratory rhythm center Respiratory rhythm center, where it is present, it is present in the medulla, right? And then we have pneumotexic center, guys. Are you listening or not? All right, so we have around 347 students with us. Pneumotexic center, a pneumotexic center is present in the pons. Where it is present, it is present in the pons. Adjacent to this respiratory rhythm center, we also have certain chemoreceptors. So the third category we have for regulation is chemoreceptors. And chemoreceptors are of two types. One is central, which is present near the medulla, near the, uh, sorry, in the medulla, near the respiratory rhythm center. And the other one we have is the peripheral one. The peripheral one is present in the carotid artery and iota. And iota. Fine. These chemoreceptors can only detect if in the blood the level of CO2 or H positive ion increases. It cannot detect the level of oxygen. Why? Because right now we have done 97% of hemoglobin is uh, saturated with, he, uh, with the oxygen or we can say 97% of oxygen is saturated with the hemoglobin. So you cannot detect how much uh, oxygen is present in the free form because it's very less. Okay, so chemoreceptors can only detect, this is the most common question that can be asked, only the level of CO2 and H positive ions are detected by chemoreceptor. For normal breathing or normal inspiration, respiratory rhythm center is involved, whereas pons uh, have a switch off center. And this alter the rate of breathing. For example, whenever you are running, at that time your breathing is shallow and fast. You breathe like, 
that's shallow and fast that is done by pons and whenever you are having deep breathing that is done by your inspiratory center or respiratory rhythm center which is in the medulla fine guys that's about your breathing and exchange of gases let's talk about body fluids and circulation okay so there is okay this one body fluids and circulation so the body fluids and circulation the very first topic i'm going to discuss is ecg so in ecg the waves and complexes are formed all right so in ECG, the waves and complexes are formed. So you can see here, P wave. What does P wave tells? P wave tells about atrial depolarization and atrial systole. That means atria will contract here. QRS complex, it tells about ventricular depolarization. We say that right after Q, are you listening? Right after Q the ventricular systole starts. QRS complex tells about ventricular depolarization. Right after Q, the ventricular contraction of systole, it starts. T wave tells about depolarization of ventricles. And we say end of T wave, end of T wave is the end of systole, end of ventricular systole so that means when the t waves end the ventricular repolar uh, the ventricular uh, diastole will start okay so end of t wave is end of ventricular systole t wave otherwise represent ventricular depolarization but up to here the ventricular sorry not depolarization i have uh, read uh, I, I was saying uh, repolarization okay so that's why ventricular repolarization so whenever here the t wave ends the ventricular systole will also end so from now here ventricular diastole will start okay guys now moving further to the next one after q after q ventricular systole starts ventricular systole starts let's talk about the cardiac cycle very important okay let's talk about the cardiac cycle guys cardiac cycle in cardiac cycle the entire cycle is for 0 0.8 second in which joint diastole is for 0 0.4 second can you see that what happens during joint diastole during joint diastole, your entire heart is relaxing. Both your atria and ventricles, both your atria and ventricles, they are, they are what? They are what doing? They are entirely relaxing. As a result, there is 70% filling of ventricle. So, the maximum filling, 70% fill of ventricle. Maximum filling of the ventricles, it occurs in joint diastole. After joint diastole starts the atrial systole, which is for very short duration, 0.1 second. Now, during atrial systole, 30% filling of ventricle starts or it uh, uh, around 100% of ventricles gets filled. So, one question can be asked that uh, uh, how much uh, or the where does the maximum filling of ventricles occur? So, you will say in the uh, you will say in your joint diastole okay then after ventricular uh, after atrial systole ventricular systole will start here ventricular systole will start here now ventricular systole is for 0 0.3 second so when the ventricular systole start you will get the first heart sound that is lub that is lub and it occurs due to closure of av valves so if someone asks you when does the first heart sound starts you will say during beginning of ventricular systole and now when the ventricular systole ends or diastole starts second heart sound will come and that is your dub that is your dub so this heart sound which is the second heart sound dub it occurs due to closure of semilunar valves so whenever you shut the door you will hear a sound Whenever you shut the door, you will hear a sound. So this is what it happens here. So when you, whenever you uh, when you shut the door, you hear a sound. So here the door that's are shut are AV valves, and here are your semilunar valves. Okay, guys. Yes, simple. Okay. So that's about your cardiac cycle. So in the each cardiac cycle, whenever there is ventricular systole, whenever there is high pressure in the ventricles, some amount of blood it moves through the blood vessel. And what is that amount of blood? Seventy ml. And you call it a stroke volume. So here comes the concept of cardiac output. What is cardiac output, guys? Cardiac output is stroke volume into heart rate. Stroke volume is 70 ml and heart rate is around 72 beats per minute. Approximately 5 liter 
per minute is your cardiac output so this is the amount of blood you pump from each ventricle one ventricle per minute amount of blood you pumped out from each ventricle per minute you know sometime you know numerical kind of a question can be asked they might change the heart rate they might change the cardiac output and ask you to uh, uh, find out the stroke volume okay so this is how you can find the stroke volume by this cardiac output okay all right let's talk about the electrical uh, activity of heart if this is your heart this is the right side of the heart and this is the left side of the heart here you have a pacemaker known as san sinoatrial node pacemaker it can generate maximum nerve impulse uh, or the uh, cardiac uh, because they are nodal tissues they are made up of uh, cardiac muscle fibers but they are excitable so it can generate a lot of nerve impulse and then it can send this nerve impulse to this portion known as avn what is this avn all we say that our cardiac muscles are auto excitable auto rhythmic that means they are not dependent on the neurons for their uh, impulse generation all they can do it is they can themselves generate the nerve impulse okay so here what you say is that whenever san uh, it starts to generate its impulse it will send the impulse to the both atria and then it will send to the another uh, another nodal tissue which you call it as avian atrioventricular node because it is connecting atria and the ventricle the san's location is on the right upper corner of the right atrium the location of avian is on the lower corner of the right atrium both are present at right atrium then we have here then we have here the bundle of his atrioventricular bundle which divides into two halves left and right which gave rise to purkinje fibers which gave rise to purkinje fibers fine and purkinje fibers are the fastest conducting they are the fastest conducting fine yes do you have any doubts here just uh, give a look hurry up let's give a look to this one Hurry up guys, hurry up, hurry up. All right, all right, all right. Let's talk about a quick about the structure of the heart, okay? So if you have seen the structure of our heart already, so this is the right atrium, this is the left atrium, these are the ventricles. First of all, we have septums here. One septum is between two atria, the right atria and the left, uh, left atria. One septum is between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Out of this, the thickest septum is between the ventricle. So, interventricular septum. So, the interventricular septum is the thickest one. Out of which, out of all, which is the thickest septum, guys? Interventricular septum. Okay, got it. So, out of all, the thickest one is the interventricular septum. Okay. Now, another one about the valves so av valves are present between both atria and the ventricle here we have tricuspid here we have bicuspid here we have tricuspid valve and here we have bicuspid and bicuspid are also known as mitral valve here you will always get the deoxygenated blood here you will always get the oxygenated blood so bicuspid valve is always in contact with the oxygenated blood and tricuspid valve is always in contact with the in the which blood deoxygenated okay so now there are the blood vessels that are sending the uh, the sending the its uh, uh, you know system or capillaries to the heart muscle what type of circulation is that coronary circulation so what is a coronary circulation guys yes coronary circulation coronary circulation here the blood vessels are sending the entire uh, entire system to the heart muscles fine so coronary circulation circulation where blood vessel supplies blood to the heart muscles then here we have blood vessels one is pulmonary artery which goes to the lungs and the valve is semilunar valves these are semilunar valves and then we here we have iota that supplies blood to your entire body okay this is semilunar all right so this is it that's the structure of heart guys let's talk about the composition of blood this is important one question is asked from this portion blood is made up of 55 percent plasma and 45 percent formed elements in plasma we have water and then we have six to eight percent plasma proteins 
and there are three types of plasma protein guys so what are these plasma proteins we have albumin the most abundant protein and its function is in osmotic gradient it maintains osmotic gradient and then we have the another one which is globulin globulin in it is of different category alpha beta and gamma alpha beta helps in transport Whereas gamma forms antibody Ig immunoglobulin, and then we have the uh, prothrombin and fibrinogen, which are inactive clotting factors. So clotting factors or the proteins of clotting, they both are present in inactive form in the blood. Prothrombin and fibrinogen. Other also substances are there which are present in the dissolved form. They can be the like uh, your waste products. they can be nutrients they can be minerals like sodium ions potassium ions magnesium ions calcium ions and some bicarbonate ions fine and some buffer ions are also there in the blood in the dissolved form so that's about your uh, composition of plasma let's talk about the formed elements in formed elements we have rbc known as erythrocyte then we have wbc known as leukocyte and then thrombocyte also known as platelets out of this the thrombocytes they helps in blood clotting what is the function of thrombocytes blood clotting rbc they are the most abundant 5 to 5.5 million per mm cube the life span of rbc is 120 days then it gets uh, uh destroyed in the graveyard of rbc that's spleen and rbc have hemoglobin that's the oxygen carrier that's why it is also red in color and it is enucleated that means it's it does not have nucleus it's enucleated cell okay wbc leukocytes there of two types one is granulocytes another is a granulocyte in a granulocyte you have lymphocyte and monocyte whereas in the granulocyte you have neutrophils you have basophil and you have eosinophil you have eosinophil right let's talk about the percentage which is important from because from here from the percentage as well as from the function the questions have been asked in the previous exams also okay so here neutrophils are around 60 to 65% basophil 0.5 to 1% eosinophil 2 to 3% lymphocyte 20 to 25% right and monocyte around 6 to 8% so this is the composition of the cells now let's talk about the nucleus uh, these uh, what do you say lymphocyte they have round nucleus they have bilobed nucleus eosinophils have this bilobed nucleus like this they have kidney shaped nucleus monocyte they have bilobed they have s shaped nucleus and they have different shaped nucleus the function is neutrophils and monocyte they both are phagocytosis they undergo phagocytosis they are phagocytic cells they both are what phagocytic cells whereas lymphocyte it it perform immune response it helps in immune response and basophil here it is the one that causes allergies eosinophils is anti allergic or it comes during parasitic infections okay basophil will secrete histamine serotonin and heparin that will cause allergy eosinophils will come to fight allergy got it okay they are anti inflammatory eosinophils are anti inflammatory got it guys just have a look on these hurry up have a look on these then we'll move further yes these are important just quickly have a look on it all right okay 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 let's move further then let's talk about the disorders here first disorder is high blood pressure hypertension what is hypertension when there is uh, excessive increase in your blood pressure first of all what is a blood pressure the pressure of blood that is exerted on the blood vessels pressure of the blood exerted on the blood vessels due to pumping action of heart when your heart is pumping blood it will throw the blood with the pressure and that pressure that your blood vessels feel is your blood pressure if it is uh, the normal one is 120 80 
120 by 80 120 is systolic 80 is diastolic pressure and uh, if it exceeds 120 or 80 and moves up to 140 to 90 and it is for like longer duration if it is once or twice it's it can be fine but if it is it's a normal if a person is having for many times or many episodes then a person might be having the hypertension what can be the cause of the hypertension it can be because you have some heart disease or it can also be because uh, you are uh, you are smoking or you are obese and later on it can also affect your brain and kidneys right okay CAD coronary artery disease coronary artery disease often known as atherosclerosis affects the vessels that supply blood to the heart what are these vessels coronary blood vessels or coronary artery that's why the name of the disease is coronary artery it is caused by deposition of calcium fat cholesterol and fibrous tissue which makes the lumen of arteries narrower for example if this is a blood vessel this is the deposition of cholesterol. Now, cholesterol will attract a lot of substances and there is a formation of plaque. And these substances are calcium ion, your platelets and so. And it will narrow the lumen and there will be increase in blood pressure. Okay. Angina. Now, what happens sometimes when your coronary arteries block, you will not get enough oxygen or the not enough oxygen will be provided to the heart muscle. So, you call this as myocardial ischemia. What is myocardial ischemia? In myocardial ischemia, there is low oxygen. There is low oxygen. And due to that low oxygen, your heart muscle will die and cause you a pain. So that is angina pectoris. A symptom of acute chest pain appears when no enough oxygen is reaching the, reaching the heart muscle. So what is that condition where no, heart, uh, no oxygen is reaching to the heart muscle? That is myocardial ischemia fine but the symptom of this chest pain that starts in the left chest and move to the left arm is angina pectoris angina can occur in men and women of any age but it is more common among the middle age and elderly what is that middle age around 40 50 right it occurs due to condition that affects the blood flow heart failure now heart failure usually occur to people who are very old in heart failure means the state of heart when it is not pumping the blood effectively enough to meet the needs of the body the heart is failed why because it is old so it is not pumping the blood effectively the cardiac output will be low what is heart attack in heart attack because your heart muscles are not getting oxygen so the heart muscles are dying what is cardiac arrest arrest means when uh, when uh, a uh, policeman says you are under arrest. A person stands like that. So heart is also standing like that. That means it has stopped working. Right. So here it is sometimes called congestive heart failure because congestion of lung is the one of a common symptom of this disease. Heart failure is not same as a cardiac arrest when the heart stops beating or heart attack when the heart muscle is suddenly damaged by an inadequate blood supply. Suddenly heart stop beating, uh, beating, cardiac arrest. When I say that uh, heart muscle is not getting oxygen, that is, that is heart attack. When heart is not pumping the blood effectively, that is heart failure. Three things that you should know. Okay. So that's about the disorders guys. Just have a look. Then we'll start with the excrety products and its elimination. Yes. Then we'll start with the excrety products and its elimination. All right. Okay. So the most important thing in this is this diagram. And this is this diagram. Okay. Let me just, just give me a moment, guys. I have a little issue in my eyes today. Okay. All right. Okay, so this is very important. First of all, we'll start with the PCT. What type of epithelium PCT have brush bordered? Epithelium, cuboidal, simple cuboidal. Okay, so here it leads to the active reabsorption of nutrients. First of all, if someone asks you where does the active reabsorption of nutrients like glucose takes place, then you will say PCT. In PCT, there is absorption of almost everything, 70 to 80% of water and electrolytes. 70 to 80% water and electrolytes that takes place in PCT. Okay. Next, then we have loop of Henle. In loop of Henle, remember, in loop of Henle, remember, there is only permeability of water in the descending limb of loop of Henle, or I will say in the descending one, there is a permeability of only water. 
and in the ascending there is permeability of nacl as well as urea so from where this urea is coming urea is coming from the collecting duct which is which is doing the secretion in the dct there is reabsorption of nacl and water and hco3 negative most important thing in dct there is conditional reabsorption of na and water conditional reabsorption of sodium ions and water by aldosterone aldosterone is, is the hormone that is secreted by adrenal cortex adrenal cortex secretes the hormone aldosterone and uh, it will go to dct and ask the dct to reabsorb sodium ions and water right to reabsorb sodium ions and water because aldosterone is coming only then it is undergoing reabsorption so you call it as conditional reabsorption what you call it as conditional reabsorption so here you have reabsorption of water here you have reabsorption of water Fine. So uh, that's uh, what segment is doing. So out of all these structure, which structure help in the concentration of urine? So in concentration of urine, only two structures are responsible. One is loop of Henle, and another is vasa recta. Because both are having opposite flow, so you call it as counter current. So counter current is the only function of counter current is to increase osmolarity down the medulla from 300 to 1200 milliosmol. How many times it is concentrating? Four times. So means it will make four times concentrated urine because collecting duct here you call it as a urine. Otherwise, uh, up to these stages, your entire fluid is filtrate. But when it comes to this portion, only then it is considered as urine. And two I, uh, two molecules that are performing an important role in counter current is NaCl and urea. And why it is uh, why counter current is uh, successful here? Because it is a opposite flow. And due to opposite flow and differential permeability of loop of Henle, the counter current is a success that leads to the formation of concentrated urine. How much? Around four times. So we have two types of nephron, guys. Two type of nephrons. What are these? One is cortical. Another is juxtamedullary. Are you listening or not? Cortical, another is juxtamedullary. So which is the most abundant one? Cortical is the most abundant one. Most abundant. This is only present in the cortex region. Whereas juxtamedullary, they, they work during water shortage condition. Okay. Now out of all these segments of your nephron, which part is present in the cortex? This can be a question. So here... In the cortex, we have Bowman's capsule, glomerulus, PCT, and DCT. Whereas loop of Henle and collecting duct, as you can see, where are they present? They are present in the medulla. These both structure, they are present in the medulla. Okay, guys? Okay. All right. Very nice, very nice. Moving further to the disorders of uh, excretion. First is renal calculi. What is renal calculi? Kidney stones. What is renal calculi, guys? Kidney stones. And they are made up of uh, oxalates, calcium oxalate. Fine. And they cause pain in the kidney. Glomerulonephritis, inflammation of glomeruli. Inflammation of glomeruli. Okay. This is uh, uh, These are the two disorders. Apart from this, uh, there are like ketonuria and glucosuria. So, in which condition do you face ketonuria and glu uh, glucosuria? Ketonuria is present of ketone bodies in the urine. Glucosuria present of presence of glucose in the urine. And this is seen in the case of people who are diabetic. In the uh, in case of diabetes, mellitus. Okay. Now, let's talk about the regulation. Very important because uh, a lot of you gets confused in the regulation part. So, we'll start with the regulation. If I talk about the regulation in the kidney function, first regulation that we have is of renin, RAS, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So what happened here? Whenever there is decrease in GFR, what is GFR? Glomerular filtration rate, 125 ml per minute. If you remember or not, yes, or 180 liter per day. So here, if the GFR, it reduces because the blood flow reduces, there is low blood flow. As a result, there is low filtrate formation and uh, or there is uh, less amount of sodium ion filtrate. And this will be detected by macular denser cell. What are macular denser cell? These are special cells of DCT. And these cells will tell to JG cell. What are JG cell? Juxtaglomerular cells and these are the cells present in afferent arteriole. 
Now what will happen next? JG cells will secrete renin. JG cell secretes two component. One is renin and another is erythropoietin. Erythropoietin has nothing to do here. Its only function is in erythropoiesis. Erythro means RBC, erythro, erythrocyte. Poietin, poiesis, poiesis means synthesis. So it's a protein which will help in the synthesis of RBC. Okay, guys. Then we have renin. What does renin do? The common question that can be asked, renin convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, which later on gets converted into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 performs a lot of functions. One function is that it will cause vasoconstriction. That means it increases resistance in the blood vessel, increasing the GFR. Second, it will tell the PCT for the reabsorption of NaCl and water and it will go to adrenal gland and it will ask the adrenal gland to secrete aldosterone and once the aldosterone is secreted, it will go to DCT and there will be sodium and water reabsorption. Sodium and water reabsorption. Take a look, hurry up. This is important. Hurry up guys, take a look. This is important. Then we have, then we have ADH. How does ADH work? ADH, whenever you have low water in the body, whenever you have low blood volume or low water in the body, ADH, also known as vasopressin, it will come to you from the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus secretes the ADH and it stores it in the posterior pituitary. From the posterior pituitary, on signal by the hypothalamus, it will be sent to you in your blood. And then what it will do? It will cause NaCl and water reabsorption. NaCl and water reabsorption from distal tubules. Second, it will, uh, this ADH, ADH can also cause vasoconstriction increasing the GFR. So technically its function is to save water. Both renin uh, system and this they are saving water. Third is the opposite of all ANF. Atria natriuretic factor. As its name says atria. It comes from walls of the heart. Atrias. Atrial walls of the heart. Right. This one inhibit. Ras and ADH. So, so it works opposite to RAS and ADH. If it is working opposite to it, so whenever you have high amount of ANF, there will be more dilute urine because this one prevents diuresis. Diuresis means dilute urine. Diuresis means formation of dilute urine. What is a dilute, dilute urine? Urine with more water. Okay, so if you are getting a lot of water or you are urinating a lot, that means maybe in your body ANF is more, right? Also, it causes vasodilation. It also causes vasodilation. Okay, so that's about the regulation, guys. That's about the regulation. Please uh, don't talk like extra things on, on this chat, guys. What are you doing? What rubbish are you saying here? Come on. Tomorrow is, you know, students exam and you are talking this things here. Just go and study. Just go and study and let others study too. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's move further, guys. Let's move further. Okay. So here, Renin. Is with the single N. All right. It goes with the flow, guys. It goes with the flow. Now you know. Okay. Next we have is your locomotion and movement. So the most important topics from the locomotion and movement is the... What are you saying in chat here? Why? Why? Why are you doing this? Please go. I request all of you who are like talking so much over here and talking nonsense Please go away from this chat box and please study. If you are, an, you are a neat aspirant, so it's really bad. You should study. It's just the last movement. And let others study too. Okay. 
All right. So locomotion and movement. The most important topic is about ribs. Rib cage. So rib cage is formed by three types of bone. One is sternum. So what is formed? Or let me just tell you how rib cage is formed. Rib cage is formed by three types of bone: ribs, thoracic vertebrae. And the last one is your yes sternum. Sternum is present ventrally. That means on this side, on this side. Okay. So here your ribs are twelve pairs. How many ribs are there? Twelve pairs. They are flat bones and they are bicephalic. What is bicephalic? At one end they have these two head-like structures, and these two head-like structures they articulate with the thoracic vertebrae. They articulates with the thoracic vertebrae okay so here there are 12 pairs of rib out of these 12 pairs the first seven pairs are true ribs 8 9 and 10 are false ribs and 11 and 12 pair they are floating ribs why because first seven pair of ribs they are dorsally attached to thoracic vertebrae and in the front they are attached to the sternum and they are attached to the sternum through the costal cartilage known as hyaline cartilage. You can see here. Okay. So you can see this cartilage here. That's the hyaline cartilage. But 8th, 9th, 10th, they are not attached to the sternum. Rather, they are attached to the chondra or the cartilage. They are attached to the, you can see here, 8, 9 and 10. They are attached to the cartilage of the 7th rib. That's why they are false. Because dorsally they are attached to thoracic vertebrae. But ventrally they are not attached to sternum. If they would have directly attached to sternum, they would have been true. Okay. Then the floating one here you can see, they are not attached to anything ventrally. And in fact they do not assist in the breathing as well. Okay. So here... 8, 9, 10, they are false. They are attached to the um, cartilage of the 7th vertebra, 7th oh, uh, uh, rib. Okay, do not forget this. So, that's the most common question that is asked in the chapter locomotion and movement. Let's move further and uh, talk about the this portion. First of all, diseases. Then we'll talk about the muscle contraction. Okay. So, here you can see myasthenia gravis. What is myasthenia gravis? It is autoimmune disorder. So, one thing that you lot of you get uh, confused here is myasthenia gravis is autoimmune and dystrophy is the genetic disorder. In dystrophy, from dystrophy, remember there is a protein dystropin. And when the protein is not formed properly, you call that as the genetic disorder. Why? Because its genes are not formed completely. So, in the dystrophy, dystropin protein is not formed. Which protein? Dystropin protein is not formed. Whereas this one is autoimmune leads to paralysis of skeletal muscle. In tetany, there is rapid spasm or wild contraction is muscle due to low calcium ion in the body fluid. For example, this is a muscle cell and this is a body fluid. So, in body fluid, there is a low calcium ion. If there is a low calcium ion in the body fluid, this leads to a condition known as tetany. Next, we have arthritis. Arthritis is inflammation in joints. Where is osteoporosis? Whenever a female gets old, she got menopause, her estrogen levels go down. And if her estrogen levels go down, in female, estrogen is the hormone that helps in the deposition of calcium on the bones. If there is no estrogen, then there will be, bones will be thin and there will be pores formed in the bone known as osteoporosis. Age-related disorder characterized by decreased bone mass and increased chances of fracture. Decreased level of estrogen is a common cause. Then we have gout. It is also inflammation in joint due to accumulation of uric acid crystal. One such type of uh, 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 the uh, arthritis is a rheumatoid arthritis. In rheumatoid arthritis, it is also autoimmune. What happened in this one? There is more antibodies formed against the joints and that's why it is known as arthritis, inflammation in the joints and that is also autoimmune. Fine. Okay. So, uh, in locomotion, another question that can be asked is from muscle contraction about the contraction of muscle. Here, we have sarcomere. In the sarcomere, we have these filaments known as actins. We have actins here, guys. We have actins here and here we have myosin. Okay. So, first question can be from thin filament. Which, uh, which subunit of your thin filament 
which subunit of thin filament binds to the calcium ion to unmask the myosin binding site on actin that's troponin the thin filament is made up of three components if you remember one is actin troponin tropomyosin and out of this the troponin have myosin binding site and whereas troponin binds to calcium ion so this one binds to calcium ion so whenever there is muscle contraction these thin filaments they move inwards these thin filament they move inward so when they will move inward what will happen during maximum contraction these actin filaments will overlap each other and this one will cover up the entire space so in maximum contraction guys in maximum contraction a band remains same a band remains same i band disappears m line disappears right h zone disappear what is h zone this portion is a h zone so can you see any h zone in this one i can't see it and i band it also disappears because uh, the myosin it moves like this and the length of the uh, these proteins it remains unchanged the length also remains unchanged there is no change in the length of the molecules fine guys yes do you get it hurry up let me know let me know so always remember during contraction the length of these thin and thick filament it remains unchanged the length of the thin and thick filament it remains unchanged okay now the most important topic here is joints so we have three types of joint this is a most common question asked that you will definitely see one question from joint okay so here one type of a joint is a fibrous joint Second is a cartilaginous joint, and third is a synovial joint. Third is a synovial joint. Okay, all right. Let's see. So here you can see fibrous is a fixed joint, immovable joint. You will not be able to move it at all. The cartilaginous one is slightly movable. You can move it a little. it is slightly movable whereas the synovial one is highly movable you can move it as much as you want so let's talk about their location so this is present in the sutures of skull sutures of skull you remember skull bones which is present in the sutures of the skull fine and second it can also be find in your gums tooth there are two bones that are attached here in the gums one is the teeth itself is like a bone and second the bone in which teeth is embedded okay and uh, the cartilaginous one is present between ribs and sternum and hip bones also in the hip bones and uh, also in your two vertebras or intervertebral disc then we have here the synovial synovial is of various kind one you have is ball and socket so how do you throw the ball you throw the ball like this so this joint is ball and socket so this is formed by humerus head and which bone is present here scapula and this glenoid cavity of the scapula okay so here you have is the which joint this one shoulder similar is present in your hip in hip joint also we have thigh bone which is femur its head is fitted in the hip bone what part of hip bone acetabulum guys this is also important in hip in the hip joint we have acetabulum and in the shoulder one we have glenoid cavity so in glenoid cavity it is present in the pectoral girdles bone sca uh, scapula whereas acetabulum is present in the pelvic girdles hip bone okay next we have uh, is your hinge joint hinge joint is present in your knee and your elbow then you have saddle joint saddle saddle word sad sad very sad who is sad four fingers are together the thumb is alone so saddle joint thumb is also sad why because four fingers are together he is alone so saddle joint is present between carpal and metacarpal of thumb right carpal and metacarpal of thumb
right and then we have pivot joint pivot joint is present between atlas and axis what is atlas and axis atlas and axis are your first and second cervical vertebra so you can move these uh, bone your head or your neck like this this is because of your this atlas and axis fine okay yes is this clear is this clear guys all right all right okay 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 so that's about uh, your joints one more thing we should also cover here is uh, your types of muscle fiber skeletal muscle fiber you must have heard of it red and white muscle fiber red and white muscle fiber what's the difference between the two the red is red why because it has high quantity of blood vessel it has high quantity of mitochondria it has high quantity of the pigment myoglobin because it has a lot of mitochondria so that's why it undergoes aerobic respiration that means the respiration that will take place in the presence of oxygen whereas this one white one it has only more sarcoplasmic reticulum sarcoplasmic reticulum is present in your muscles skeletal muscles and it stores calcium ion and whatever thing have calcium it appears white like milk like bones right so that's why it also appear white and uh, it undergoes anaerobic respiration because it has everything low in quantity low blood vessel low mitochondria low myoglobin so that's why if it gets fatigue it will deposit lactic acid so whenever there is deposition of lactic acid you call it as muscle fatigue okay you call it as muscle fatigue all right guys so that's the most important questions or topics from the locomotion and movement let's talk about neural control and coordination let's talk about neural control and coordination all right neural control and coordination now what are the most important topics from neural control and coordination first of all you can see it on the screen that's i that's i okay so we'll take a break of 10 minutes and then we'll start with the neural control till then you just uh, read what we have done till now okay let's have a yes i will be covering biotechnology to rajwardhan every every single topic will be covered don't worry don't worry every single uh, topic will be covered topic in sense i'll be covering every chapter but the most important topics from that chapter it's quite uh, technically impossible to teach you each and every topic and in much detail so i'm covering those topics which are quite important okay so let's just have uh, this of 10 minutes okay and i'll come back again
All right, guys. Can you hear me? So, can you hear me, guys? Can you hear me or not? Give me thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes. Give me thumbs up if you can hear me. Hurry up, hurry up. Yes, Parinita can hear me. All right. So, the first very important topic from this uh, chapter is uh, neural control and coordination. Chapter is your eye. Okay. So, eye, if I talk about you have two eyes and where it is present in the socket of the skull. So, what are the various layers of the eye? First of all, the outermost layer is sclera, which is the white of the eye. This sclera will comes up in the anterior portion. Anteriorly, it is thin. Anteriorly, it is thin and it forms cornea. And cornea, if you know, it is avascular. It does not have a blood supply. It is rich in collagen fibers. It is rich in collagen fibers. And it is very thin, transparent and refractive body. Thin and transparent. Okay. If we talk about the lens, lens is made up of proteins. Crystalline protein. Crystalline proteins. It helps in focusing of the light. Between lens and corneas present this chamber known as aqueous chamber, which have water-like fluid known as aqueous fluid. Whereas the chamber present behind the lens is a vitreous chamber, which have a gel-like vitreous humor, which have a gel-like vitreous humor, right? Then we have the uh, more inner, if we'll go towards, then we have a blue-black colored layer known as Choroid. Choroid, posteriorly it is thin, just opposite to sclera. Anteriorly it is thick and it is forming ciliary body, which is muscular and vascular. And which later on moves upward and form iris, which is the color part of the eye. The one we say, na, you have blue eyes, hypnotize, <laughs> or we say black eyes, brown eyes, that is because of the iris. So there is a door between the iris, there is a door between the iris, that is your pupil. So, this is pupil from where light enters. Okay. Now, one question that has been asked previously also. What is the arrangement of these all things? First, we have a ciliary body. Ciliary body then forms the iris. Also, with ciliary bodies are attached these ligaments. These suspensory ligaments, which then are attached to the lens. So, first we have ciliary body. Then we have ligaments. Then the lens is attached to the ligaments. Lens is not di directly attached to the ciliary body. It is attached to the lens. All right, guys. Yes. Okay. Next, then we have retina. So, on the retina, you can see this portion known as fovea. Fovea is a. Uh, it has a you know uh, pit-like portion here. This uh, region is macula, yellow color portion is there and it only contains cons. What does it con? It contains, it only contains cons. Here the resolution is maximum, the brightest image is formed on this portion. So whenever you see anything, the image is formed here, the lights are focused here. In the retina, we have two types of cells. One is rods, another are cons. One is rods, another are cons. If we talk about the rods, these rods, they work in dim light. Scotopic vision, you call it as scotopic vision. Okay. Or moonlight. And it works in bright light. Okay, what am I writing? Bright light. And it helps us to see colors. The cons, they help us to see colors. Okay, so the there are pigments, there are pigments that are present in the rods and cons. What is their name? The pigment present in the uh, cons is iodopsin and the pigment present here in the rods is the rhodopsin. Is the rhodopsin. And these pigments, they both are pre um, formed of two components. One is retinal, other is opsin protein. Retinal is a derivative of vitamin A. Vitamin A is retinol. It becomes aldehyde, it becomes retinal. So, this retinal is that's a purplish uh, pigment, purple color pigment. Uh, that uh, this purple color pigment, for example, if I say it is rhodopsin, right? So, it contains the retinal, and retinal is derived from vitamin A. Okay, so what's the color of this? Purple color. They are okay, everything goes away. So, that's around purple color. Okay, now moving further to the arrangement of retina, arrangement of retina. So, how the wall of retina it is made up of? First of all, it has these cells known as 
photoreceptor cells you call it as rods and cones rods have rod shape and cones have cone shape like this right for example guys here you have uh, the pigmented layer you have the pigmented layer of retina and then you have this pigmented layer of choroid this is choroid and then you will have the cells which are bipolar cells here bipolar cells here and then you will be having ganglionic cells what cells ganglionic cells like this okay and then they will open to the optic nerve an optic nerve will leave will leave the eye at which point at this point known as blind spot so blind spot blind spot is a point where there is no retina and no images formed no retina and no images formed and here here optic nerve leaves and blood vessels enter optic nerve leaves and blood vessels enter fine guys so lateral to the blind spot is present with this portion which is fovea this is what its location is at the posterior pole lateral to the blind spot okay all right then from here the uh, light enters like this so now what happens when the light enters so when the light enters the pigments uh, present in the wall of these rods and cones so for example this is rods okay this is cones so they have pigments present in their walls these rhodopsins are present in the walls only okay so in the rods we have rhodopsin and in rhodopsin it is made up of retinal plus opsin and retinal and opsins are joined here like that so whenever their light comes they will dissociate they will dissociate retinal and opsin have a breakup now okay so when they will dissociate when they will dissociate there will there will be change in the color so because this was a purple color might be change into a little kind of a orangish color okay and you call it as photo bleaching photo means light and light bleach the color changes the color as a result now what will happen as a result now what will happen so here there will be depolarization and when there is a depolarization it gives a sensation of dark darkness so whenever you are in the dark your rods are working and they are getting depolarized and whenever you are in under light for example now you are might be in the light conditions right at that time cones are working so whenever someone is under the light condition at that time there will be hyperpolarization and whenever someone is in the dark when there is low light then there will the these uh, cones uh, these when you are under the dark light the rods they will undergo depolarization they will undergo depolarization so see it okay see it carefully from here once a question has been asked all right okay all right guys let's move further then let's move further and talk about the ear let's talk about the ear so in ear there are three parts one is the outer ear up to this is the outer ear which consist of the spina external auditory canal and this tympanum tympanum outside it is made up of a skin and inside it is made up of a mucous membrane fine so then it leads to the middle ear in the middle ear we have three bones what are these three bones yes malus incus and stapes they help in the amplification of sound it increases the sound okay so amplification of a sound we have malus incus and stape another there is a small window known as a oval window so oval window and these bones they increases the or they amplify the sound also in the middle ear there is a tube that is going on which is a stachian tube and a stachian tube it opens to pharynx it opens to pharynx and what is a pharynx is a common chamber for food and air pharynx is a common chamber for food and air okay listen to me very carefully pharynx is a common chamber for food and air so here is stachian tubes open into the pharynx why because here the air you will engulf from the mouth will go to this portion and also air from outside is coming to this portion so as a result it will equalize the pressure between uh, between both the sides of tympanic membrane known as ear drum it is also known as ear drum so the sound waves will be collected by the ear goes to this canal hit the drum and then what will happen it will go to the ear ossicles and ear ossicles will amplify the sound malus incus and stape now stape opens into the window known as oval window and oval window opens into cochlea where does it open into the cochlea so imagine this is a oval window and this is the cochlea this is the round window 
there are two membranes present in the cochlea this is a open portion of cochlea inner ear is also known as labyrinth what do you call to the inner ear labyrinth labyrinth in hindi you call it as bhulbhulaiya because it is like a bhulbhulaiya the outer labyrinth is bony from outside it is made up of bone for example if i say this outside portion is entire a bone this portion is entire a bone it's a bony labyrinth fine and inside portion is made up of membrane you call it as membranous labyrinth and this labyrinth have two parts one is a vestibule this portion this portion is vestibule and this portion is cochlea this is cochlea okay so this portion is cochlea now you can see it is made up of membrane so the upper membrane's name is reasonard's membrane and the lower membrane is basilar's membrane basilar's membrane and basilar's membrane have a small organ known as organ of cot eye an organ of cot eye contains hair cell it contains hair cells which helps in which helps in yes in the listening of sound okay and it is further connected to your eighth uh, cranial nerve which is the auditory nerve fine guys okay let's talk about uh, the balancing portion in the balancing of ear we have vestibule we have vestibule okay in the vestibule we have cristae and semicircular canals and then we have the utricle and secule the utricle and secule contains the organ maculae okay they contains the organ maculae whereas the cristae they are present in the structure known as ampulla so ampulla contains cristae utricle and secule contains macula and macula have otolith organ otolith are the organs of calcium carbonate so any of the words if they comes in the exam they are related with balancing of your body they will be related with the balancing of body they will be related with balance whereas organ of cot eye hair cells they are related with the hearing they will be related with hearing fine okay so that's about your ear guys next topic that we are going to discuss is the functions of the various parts of the brain so if you remember the brain is divided into how many parts fore brain mid brain and hind brain and hind brain okay see guys from here the questions have been asked in the previous year so please pay attention here so in the hind brain we have medulla we have pons and we have cerebellum cerebellum helps in balancing pons have pneumotaxic center medulla have vomiting center and cardiovascular center medulla have centers what are these centers cardiovascular to increase or decrease the heartbeat it has vomiting center as well and also one is your respiratory rhythm center if you remember fine whereas pons have pneumotaxic center it has pneumotaxic center and the function of cerebellum is in balancing talking about the midbrain what is the function of midbrain midbrain consists of corpora quadri gemina and cerebral peduncles and cerebral peduncles okay so midbrain uh, in midbrain we have cerebral peduncles and corpora quadri gemina it's uh, usually responsible for reflexes vision and auditory reflexes this corpora quadrigemina is responsible for vision and auditory reflexes so whatever reflexes are coming here of hearing and vision it's from midbrain in the forebrain we have olfactory lobes obviously its function is in uh, smell and then here what do we have cerebrum we have cerebrum which is a seat of intelligence and then we have hypothalamus epithalamus and thalamus okay 
hypothalamus plays a very 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 important role guys in hypothalamus it uh, controls emotions hunger thirst and body temperature so it's a thermostat also there are certain uh, parts of cerebrum that controls emotion along with the hypothalamus that forms your limbic system so limbic system is a part of your forebrain only guys limbic system is a part of forebrain it contains hippocampus hypothalamus amygdala it contains hippocampus amygdala septum nuclei right so these are the part of your uh, limbic system and the main function of limbic system is that it controls emotions it controls emotions fine okay so next is from the uh, action potential one okay so how does uh, the nerve impulse is generated first of all there is a inner negative charge outer positive you call it as resting membrane potential that is minus 70 millivolt okay then the stimulus arises which leads to the opening of which ion channels sodium ion channels sodium ion channels enter that leads to depolarization and depolarization leads to action potential so in action potential the reverse happens inside positive outside negative now opposite will occur the potassium ion channels will open and there is exit of potassium ions and which will lead to repolarization inside negative outside positive that's repolarization depolarization have plus 30 millivolt of action potential here and this one have minus 70 sometimes it goes to up to minus 90 millivolt you call it as hyperpolarization since here the concentration of ions have been disturbed we always say outside there should be higher sodium ions and inside there should be high potassium ions in repolarization the reverse has taken place outside potassium has been increased inside sodium has been increased so how it will go to resting membrane potential back by maintaining its ionic uh, ionic concentration by which pump sodium potassium atps pump so what does this pump do this pump will give three sodium ions outside and two potassium ions inside by using the ATP from here a lot of questions can be asked so please one see it carefully hurry up see it hurry up guys so that's it about neural control we'll start with the chemical we'll start with the chemical soon Okay, very nice, very nice. All right, all right. Okay, moving further to the chapter chemical control and coordination. So, here we'll just be talking about the glands and the hormones and the functions. Okay, first gland we have is hypothalamus. Then we have pituitary. Then we have thyroid. Then we have parathyroid. Then we have uh, pancreas. Then we have adrenal gland. Okay, and we have thymus. Pineal. Let's get started. So the hormone secreted. <coughs> Secreted by the hypothalamus is inhibiting and releasing hormones. Inhibiting and releasing hormones, they control anterior pituitary. Whereas it also secretes ADH and oxytocin. What is the role of ADH? ADH prevents diuresis that we have done. Oxytocin is a birth hormone. It causes muscle contraction and leads to the birth of the baby. Also, it uh, helps in ejection of milk. It helps in milk let down. Milk is produced by prolactin. It is uh, released out by the uh, oxytocin. Then we have pituitary. Pituitary secretes a lot of hormone. Let's get started. Growth hormone, uh, LH, luteinizing hormone, FSH. ACTH, adrenal corticotrophic hormone, it will go to adrenal cortex and causes its growth. 
TSH thyroid stimulating hormone it will go to the thyroid and uh, causes causes its growth then we have prolactin that leads to the production of milk and then MSH melanocyte stimulating hormone which will go to melanin producing cells known as melanocyte of your skin and causes the secretion of melanin pigment then we have thyroid thyroid secretes T3 and T4 out of which T4 is thyroxin and it also secretes calcitonin Calcitonin has a function to do with the uh, calcium regulation. It decreases blood calcium level. T4, T3, T4 is thyroxine. Uh, they are iodinated thyronins. That means their hormone that, um, uh, you know, uh, that contains iodine in them. And they regulate your BMR. And there are disorders related with it. With the growth hormone, we have two disorders. One is gigantism. There is increase in growth hormone then there is dwarfism, there is decrease in growth hormone. In the thyroxine one, we have hypothyroidism, if thyroxine level decreases, then hyperthyroidism if the thyroxine level increases. In hypothyroidism, in hypothyroidism, what are the disorders we have? In hypothyroidism, we have simple goiter. In simple goiter, it occurs due to iodine deficiency. And also, we have hypothyroidism in children, C4 children, C4 cretinism, and myxedema in the adults. Right? If we have hyperthyroidism, that is exophthalmic goiter. It is autoimmune. So, there are two goiters. So, mind it, simple goiter is due to less level and uh, exophthalmic is due to the higher level okay guys then we have parathyroid it secrete pth parathyroid hormone it uh, it works opposite to calcitonin it uh, in, uh, increases blood calcium this one decreases blood calcium pancreas we have glucagon and insulin we have already done uh, insulin decreases blood sugar and glucagon increases blood sugar adrenal cortex uh, adrenal gland have two areas cortex and medulla the cortex Cortex. Cortex secretes corticoids and corticoids are steroids in nature. What are these? Aldosterone, mineralocorticoid. So as you know, what does it do? It will go to DCT and ask it to reabsorb sodium and water. And it also leads to secretion of potassium ions. And second thing is cortisol. Cortisol is immunosuppressant and it also increases blood sugar. It also increases blood sugar. Cortisol increases blood sugar. Growth hormone increases blood sugar, glucagon increases blood sugar and medulla's hormone adrenaline, it also increases blood sugar. Cortisol leads to the gluconeogenesis, lipolysis, proteolysis by which it will make the sugar. Okay, And also it is immunosuppressant, it suppresses the immunity and also it helps in erythropoiesis, synthesis of RBC. Thyroxine and cortisol both helps in erythropoiesis. They both increase the content of RBC formation. Fine. And uh, here we have adrenaline and noradrenaline, also known as epinephrine and norepinephrine. They are emergency hormones. They are used in flight and fight response. Okay. And uh, uh, in corticoids, we also have sex corticoids, which are basically androgens, which are androgens. Then we have thymus. Thymus produces thymosin. Thymosin is a hormone secreted by thymus and it is uh, uh, responsible for immune response. What is its function? It will ask the T cell to get mature and B cell to uh, multiply so that they will produce antibodies. So with time, thymus size decreases. That's why with age, the immunity decreases. Pineal gland secretes melatonin and melatonin controls sleep and wake cycle. Sleep and wake cycle. And sleep and wake cycle and also it is responsible for immune system, dispersion of melanin pigment. It also controls menstrual cycle in the female. Fine. So these are all the hormones, uh, most of the hormones. So let's talk about the classification of hormone which is important. Lipid insoluble and soluble. Guys pay attention here. This is important. Lipid soluble and lipid insoluble. The lipid soluble are the one, one which are steroid hormones. In steroid, we have corticoids, 
we have uh, the sex hormones what are the sex hormones estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and then thyroxin the iodinated hormones okay these are lipid soluble and in insoluble we have peptide hormones peptide or protein hormones or the uh, amino acid derivative in amino acid derivative we have adrenaline as an example okay also melatonin whereas steroid are the lipid soluble and thyroxine is also so if these are lipid soluble their functioning will also be different lipid soluble can easily enter inside the cell so their receptor is also inside the cell the receptor will also be inside the cell so how will they function they will alter the gene expression so lipid soluble hormone function by altering the gene expression or chromosomal function and their receptors are intracellular receptors are intracellular that means inside cell they can be cytoplasmic they can be in the cytoplasm or they can be in the nucleus so mostly the receptors mostly the receptors are in the nucleus okay guys then this is how the lipid insoluble work their receptors are they are membrane bound or extracellular and they function by second messenger they function by second messenger and what are the various example of second messenger calcium ions camp cgmp and ip3 inositol triphosphate whereas these one will function by changing the gene expression they will uh, cause the cascade of reaction and biochemical reactions fine okay let's talk about the most most awaited animal kingdom okay you will get the notes on the pw app don't worry okay so let's talk about the animal kingdom guys in animal kingdom animals are multicellular organisms some of the animals they they ju they just have cellular level of organization and others have tissue organ or organ system okay first of all the cellular level of organization is seen in porifera whereas in cilian triata and tenophora they exhibit tissue level of organization whereas platyhelminthes exhibit organ level and other all have organ system level talking about the germ layers talking about the germ layers the this does not have a germ layer because it is not even a tissue they both have diploblastic whereas all these they are triploblastic triploblastic talking about psyllom first three cilian triata tenophora and platyhelminthes they are acylomate they are acylomate ascalmanthes they are pseudocylomate whereas others they are eucylomate they are eucylomate so you means true they have true psyllom pseudo matlab or means <laughs> the false psyllom okay you know hindi comes sometimes uh, because it's our first language okay anyways so radial radial symmetry is seen in the cilian triata and tenophora and in the adult echinodermate so where do you find the radial symmetry cilian triata tenophora and adult echinodermate whereas bilateral symmetry is seen in the other all all others will exhibit bilateral symmetry fine guys okay next next let's talk about okay let's talk about the system digestive system is complete that means they have one anus another mouth incomplete only one opening that act as anus as well as mouth so you will see it in the cilian triata tenophora and platyhelminthes okay and they also known as blind sac the open circulatory you will find where there are no blood vessels no properly formed blood vessels and less efficient you find it in arthropoda you find it in arthropoda and mollusca whereas closed you can find in your annelida in the annelida and chordata okay now tell me what are segmented metamerically segmented segmented organisms are arthropoda annelida and chordata learn it from caa learn it from ca okay all right next 
so we are going to take uh, animal kingdom little seriously because i know you all must be thinking ma'am animal kingdom please how to revise we don't know so that's why i brought all the lines of ncrt here so let's get started with porifera porifera they are also known as sponges because they have pores in their body what do they have guys they have pores in their body and where do you find can you see them in the oceans or ponds no i can see them so they are usually marine they are present in the uh, you know sea water in the oceans then we have water canal system or transport system because of these pores the pores that leads to the entry of water is ostia and from where uh, the water exit that is osculum osculum and from where enters is ostia okay skeleton is made up of spicules and spongin fibers digestion is intracellular they are bisexual that means uh, both the organs will be present in the same individual and sexual and asexual reproduction is seen fertilization is inside the body they show indirect development that means they will be having larva let's talk about example so this one is sicon this one is u spongia the bath sponge sicon is skypha you you take bath daily bath sponge and this one is spongilla the fresh water sponge so this is one exception fresh water sponge okay let's move further talk about the next phylum that is your cilientrata also known as nidaria why it is cilientrata because if you'll see the uh, these phylums they inside they have a cavity inside of them is present a cavity and the name of a cavity is spongocele and it is not a true cavity it is not a true cavity but they have a true cavity known as gastrovascular cavity also known as cilientron gastrovascular cavity or cilientron and also in their body they have a cells known as nidoblast so that's why their name is nidaria if you'll see their body they have a mouth present on the structure known as hypostome and inside them there is a cavity known as gastrovascular cavity it's a true cavity it there will be a digestion process so we say that digestion is taking place in the cavity that's extracellular okay so they are marine they have a central gastrovascular cavity digestion is both intra and extracellular skeleton they form of calcium carbonate that's what forms corals and they have two uh, body forms polyp and medusa and sometimes in certain organism metagenesis takes place alternation in generation like in obelia and physalia okay and having different types of forms is polymorphism they can be uh, sessile like sea anemone and they can be motile or they can be free swimming like your jellyfish so what are example Physalia, Portuguese man of war, Adamsia sea anemone, Penetula sea pen, Gorgonia sea fan, and Mindrina brain coral. Okay. Yes, guys, are you reading it with me or not? No, ma'am. Yes or no? Yes or no? Okay. Next, next we have Tinophora. In Tinophora, they are known as sea walnuts or comb jellies. They are also marine guys. The exclusive feature they have one is bioluminescence. Second, they have comb plates. Can you see these plates? They are comb plates. They are ciliated and they helps in movement. Tentacles are also present. These are tentacles. Tentacles they help in. Uh, uh, tentacles were also present in uh, the cil uh, cilian trata. Okay, so here again digestion is same as the cilian trata nidaria, intracellular or uh, the extracellular. They also show bioluminescence. Sexual reproduction they show only show asexual is absent here. Asexual is absent. Asexual is absent. Example purobrachia and tinophora. Okay, all right. So next we have is uh, platyl menthes. They are flat worms because their body is dorsoventrally flattened and they are endoparasite. Endo means inside. So they will be living inside your body and they are present in your small intestine particularly. Hooks and suckers are present because they are parasite. They absorb food directly through body, especially in parasite. These are parasitic adaptation. Those who are not parasite, they have incomplete digestive tract, blind sac. Those 
who are parasite they don't even have a elementary canal they directly diffuse through diffusion they take the food from the surrounding they have flame cell they, that is important this is usually asked in the exam they have flame cell for excretion and osmoregulation they are also bisexual or hermaphrodite there is sexual reproduction internal fertilization that's a character of all parasite and larvas will be there in planaria you can see the power of regeneration example tenia tapeworm and fasciola is a liver fluke fine guys okay next next we have ascalmanthus nemathalensis round worms their body is circular in the cross section but like worms they are very elongated circular in cross section aquatic terrestrial parasite elementary canal is complete with muscular pharynx this is exclusive feature i am putting stars on features from where the answer uh, from where the questions can be asked okay then excretory tube is there to throw out the waste also known as h cells for excretion they are dioecious there will be male there will be female you can see this is a male ascaris this is a female ascaris and female is longer than the male because by just looking at the morphology you can identify which is a male and the female you call it as sexual dimorphism so they show sexual dimorphism cockroach also shows sexual dimorphism then we have sexual reproduction because they're parasites so internal fertilization direct or indirect both development can take place ascaris roundworm butcheraria filaria worm and chylostoma hookworm butcheraria or filarial worm causes filariasis or elephantiasis or elephantiasis okay next Annelida. Annelida word come from annulus. Annulus means rings. They are segmented body and they are present in the form of rings. Aquatic terrestrial parasite. Aquatic we have earthworm. Uh, sorry, <laughs> terrestrial we have earthworm. In aquatic we have nereis and leech. Nereis is in the marine water. Leech is in the fresh water. And leech is ectoparasite. Metamerically segmented for locomotion they have muscles and parapodia in nereis. You can see this structure. This is nereis. This is the leech. In nereis, these are extensions of the skin known as parapodia. Okay? Alright. Moving further, guys, to the next one. To the next one. A uh, closed circulatory system they have. They have ex for excretion, they have nephridia. And in neural system, they have ganglions with double ventral solid nerve coat. This is a character of all the non chordates Reproduction is sexual. We have these example. Ferritima is a earthworm. Hirodonaria is a blood sucking leech. And Neris is the clam worm. Or in NCRT, no common name is written. Fine. Okay. Next. Arthropoda. Arthro means joints. Poda means appendages. Characteristic feature, they have jointed appendages. Largest phylum, 2 by 3 species. Metamerically segmented, body divided into thorax and abdomen. You know, this is the most famous or uh, favorite topic of examiners when they are putting out the question. So, read it nicely, okay? They have chitinous exoskeleton which is made up of NAG. We have done in polysaccharides. They have open circulatory system, excretion by malpigian tubules. Here you are also revising cockroach, if you know that. <laughs> okay, respiration is through gills in case of prawns. Book gills in case of crab, king crab. Book lungs in case of spiders and trachea in case of insect. Okay. Sense organs, they have antennae, eyes and statocysts. Statocysts are always for balancing. They are always for balancing okay they are also present in mollusca reproduction is sexual dioecious male and female cockroach internal fertilization was there in the cockroach cockroach lays eggs so it's oviparous development can be direct or indirect direct is seen in lepisma what is lepisma silverfish okay example are very important in arthropods first we have apes the honeybee then we have bombyx, the silkworm, lassifer, the lac insect. They are economically important because from apes you get honey. From bombyx you get silk. From lassifer you get lac, right? Anopheles, culix, aedes, all are mosquito and they are vectors. In gregarious pest we have locusta. Locusta is a gregarious pest. It comes in uh, groups. Gregarious means which comes in groups. And living fossil we have limulus or the king crab. Why it is living fossil? Because from many years no evolution has taken place in this organism okay next 
Mollusca. Mollusca word comes from mollus. Mollus means soft-bodied animals. In this one, they can be aquatic, terrestrial or parasitic. Unsegmented body, but it is covered by shell. You can uh, think of a snail. Its body is covered by shell. Okay. And uh, the body is uh, converted or it's divided into head, muscular foot and visceral hump. They have a layer on them that is mental. Inside uh, there is present a cavity and in that cavity what do they have? They have gills and that gills helps in gills or tenidia. Gills or tenidia they helps in respiration and excretion. Do not forget this. Okay. Then we have the mouth covered by file like rasping organ known as radula. This is very important. They are also dioecious. They also lay eggs and they show indirect development and some also show direct development you can see here this is your snail fine and they also have antennae and statocyst they also have antennae and statocyst examples are very important because if the question is example based and you don't know from which phylum does it belong even you know the characters of the phylum the question you will not be able to do it right then pila is apple snail pink tada is pearl oyster sepia is your cuttlefish, loligo is squid, octopus is devilfish, aplysia is sea hair, dentalium is tusk shell and ketopleura is chitin. Guys, again, examples, very important. Okay, all right. Next is, next phylum you have is echinodermata. Echino means spine, derma means skin. They have spines on their skin. Okay, so they are aquatic, they are exclusively marine. Second, you will not find any parasites, no parasitic forms no parasites fine they their body have calcareous ossicles small small ossicle and they are sedentary they do not move they don't move much that's not in their habit okay second thing this is important adult is radially symmetrical whereas larva is bilaterally symmetrical next is in the digestive system you will find the anus for example if this is uh, your starfish this side is ventral side. Here is mouth. On the dorsal side is present anus. So anus is present here. Imagine or remember any animal who, which side the side of animal which is facing the uh, surface or the land that is ventral. Okay. So it here he has mouth or it has mouth and here the anus. Then water vascular system is present. So water vascular is in the echinodermate, canal or transport is in the porifera. Okay. And it helps in locomotion, capture, transport of food and respiration. Whereas the nidoblast, they helps in defense. Nidoblast in the cilium tree, it's nidaria. It helps in defense, capture of prey. Okay. And adhesion, encourage to stick on the things whereas this one helps in locomotion capture and transport of uh, the substances okay what are the cells that are present in porifera collar cells okay remember like in porifera porifera we have characteristic cells what are the name of these cells the spongio seal it is lined by cells known as collar cell or spongio seal or oh, sorry quanocytes Okay, just like that, your uh, these, as I've told you, they also have cells, that's where they got its name, the nidoblast. And nidoblast, they are present on mouth and tentacles. Nidoblast or sites are the cells. These cells, they help in defense, capture of prey, and encourage. That means to fix on things. So, just like that, we have water canal system in porifera. Water canal system helps in everything, respiration, excretion, reproduction, everything because the organism is not specialized. Just like that, water vascular system helps in transport. You can see it helps in transport, locomotion and uh, transport of food and, uh, and also helps in gases transport. Okay, next. Excretory system is absent. This is also exclusive feature. Dioecious, indirect development and external fertilization. Okay, guys, external fertilization. Okay, don't pay attention on chat. Just listen this, uh, what I am teaching. Otherwise, uh, if, if you'll, you will study well here, then you will remember me in the exam. Ma'am has taught us that. <laughs> right? Okay. Next. Example, Listeria starfish, Echinus is sea urchin. 
Antidonis C. lily, Cucumeria C. cucumber and Ophiora is a brittle star. Okay, that's the example. Next guys, we have hemichordata. Hemi means half. They are half chordates. Earlier they were kept in the chordates but now they are in non-chordates because they do not have notochord. All those animals which do not have notochord, they are non-chordates. Okay, so here exclusively marine. Their worm-like body, cylindrical body, anterior proboscis, a collar and trunk, and proboscis helps in excretion. This is the question that can be asked. And this one also, they have open type of circulatory system. Respiration is through gills. They are also dioecious, indirect development, water. They live in water. So any organism that lives in water, it will show external fertilization except porifera. They show internal fertilization. Example, balanoglossus, secoglossus, commonly known as tongue worm. Okay, so make sure uh, you should remember all the excretory organs of every phylum and every organism. Okay, next. Next we have chordates. What's the difference between chordates and non-chordates? In chordates, we have notochord. In chordates, central nervous system is single and present dorsally and hollow. Pharynx is perforated by gill slits. Heart is ventral. post anal tail is present. In non-chordates, notochord absent. CNS is double ventral solid, sometimes ganglionated. Gill slits are absent, heart is dorsal and post anal tail is also absent. Okay, that's the difference. Just look at them carefully. They are important guys. Look at them carefully. Hurry up. Look at them carefully. All right. Next. Cyclostomata. In cyclostomata, they appear little like fish, right? And they are anatha. In this, jaw is absent. They belong to anatha, their jaw is absent. Okay? In chordata, if you'll see the chordata, in chordata, we have two types of groups. One is protochordata. In protochordata, we have two subphylums, two subphylums one is urochordata another is cephalochordata they are kept different because they have notochord but it is not replaced by vertebral column they are very primitive organism in the urochordata larva have larva have tail and notochord whereas in cephalochordata adult have notochord but the other thing that we have is eucordata. In eucordata, also known as craniata, they have cranium and they have further vertebrata as subphylum. Subphylum vertebrata. In subphylum vertebrata, what are those organisms vertebrata have? Here the notochord is replaced by vertebral column. Notochord is replaced by vertebral column. So this vertebrata is further divided into anatha. The one without jaw and nathostomata, the one with jaw. Okay, all right, next. So, we are talking about the anatha, which have a class in it, which is cyclostomata. Okay, so here 6 to, 50, 6 to 15 pair of gill slits are present, sucking and circular mouth, that's why they are cyclostomata. Cyclo means circular, stoma means mouth. They have circular sucking mouth. Body does not have a scale and paired fins. Cranium and vertebral columns are uh, cartilaginous because here the vertebral column is uh, cartilaginous. It has been, notochord has been replaced, but the entire skeleton is cartilaginous. Cyclostomata and chondrichthys, they both have cartilaginous skeleton. Whereas, osteichthys to the next, they all have bony skeleton. They all have bony skeleton. Circulation is closed type. They have closed circulatory system. All will have closed now. They are marine, but they go for spawning to fresh water. When they have to lay eggs, they have to go to fresh water. So they start their life in fresh water. They also end their life in fresh water because after laying eggs, adults die. Example, petromycin and myxine. Petromycin is lamprey and myxine is the hagfish. Okay. Yes, I'll give you a break shortly. Pisces. Once we'll complete the animal kingdom, then I'll give you the break of 30 minutes. You have your lunch, I will have my lunch. Okay, even I need energy. I'm speaking from 11 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> right? Okay, 
so fins are present because it's a fish lives in water streamlined body and streamlined is like this which will uh, break the water current okay two chamber heart the heart is one auricle one ventricle and it only pumps deoxygenated blood and the circulation is single circulation what type of circulation guys single circulation they are cold blooded that means they will not be able to maintain their body temperature the fixed body temperature like us respiration is through gills excretion through kidney and they have lateral line sense organ which are present here to check the water current levels then sexes are separate one is male another is female let's talk about the two classes in the superclass pisces one is chondrichthys the one with the cartilaginous skeleton another is osteichthys that is one with the bony skeleton here we have you will always find chondrichthys chondrichthys are sharks where do you find shark marine water they are always in marine water right where is the mouth of the shark on the down surface ventral side so mouth is on the ventral side cartilaginous skeleton even vertebral column will be cartilaginous so any organism that have vertebral cartil uh, uh, cartilaginous vertebral column they will have notochord so in this notochord present notochord persists throughout life right scales are placoid five pairs of gills are there operculum is a gill cover that is absent swim bladder is absent swim bladder is an air bladder uh, and that helps in uh, you know buoyancy so here organism do not have so they will sink waste product is urea there fertilization is internal and they are viviparous they will give birth to young ones okay example scoliodon dogfish pristis sawfish carcharodon great white shark trigon stingray and torpedo is electric ray okay guys pay attention the questions are asked they ask question from these i'm telling you okay then opposite to that they can be found in any type of water cycloid and tenoid scales are there they have bony skeleton notochord will not be there they have terminal mouth on in the front like in labio four pair of gills they have operculum and uh, they also have swim bladder their product is ammonia external fertilization and they lay eggs example in the marine water you will find flying fish exocetus hippocampus sea horse fresh water is labio cartla is cartla clarias is uh, the magur aquarium fishes are beta the fighting fish and terophyllum the angel fish just look at this one i'm giving you 2 minutes look at look at this one hurry up hurry up hurry up give a look Hurry up! Hurry up! Yes, my dear students, don't give up. Don't give up. We'll cover the entire zoology today. You don't have to give up. I am with you. Okay. Yes. Hurry up! Hurry up! All right. Next. Next we have is amphibia. Amphi means amphi means guys both. It lives both in water as well as in land. So it's not a true terrestrial organism. First terrestrial can be amphibian. First true terrestrial uh, vertebrate is the reptile. okay okay next two pair of limbs body is divided into head and trunk you can see this does this uh, frog have neck no so the body is divided into head and trunk okay next tail may be present in some the in aquatic forms like salamander tail can be present skin is moist because it has glands okay and uh, eyes have eyelids tympanum represents the ear do uh, this uh, frog has ear no so tympanum is the first part cloaca is present what is cloaca the common opening common opening for all the system whether it is digestive excretory or your uh, what you say the urinary system respiration is through gills lungs and skin the one that takes place through skin is cutaneous and you also see this in annelida okay 
हार्ट इज थ्री चैम्बर्ड एंड द सर्कुलेशन इज इनकम्प्लीट डबल वाई इनकम्प्लीट डबल इन डबल सर्कुलेशन both the blood remains always separated here the heart is three chambered so here comes the deoxygenated blood here comes the oxygenated in ventricle it gets mixed external fertilization as you all know they go to water for laying eggs so whatever whosoever is laying eggs in water will be external fertilization it lay eggs so oviparous in direct development because it has a larva which is tadpole and tadpole is present in water the example is bufo toad rana is frog hyla is tree frog salamander is salamander each thiophis is limbless amphibians most of you sometimes do not remember the example each thiophis you are aware with bufo hyla rana but you forget each thiophis so remember it is also an amphibian okay but it does not have limbs next next we have reptiles reptiles what come from repper reptum to crawl or to creep so these animals have two pair of limbs they are mostly terrestrial they have a well adapted terrestrial habit adaptations then body is dry that's the terrestrial adaptation like we have dry skin they have dry skin like in amphibians they had the glands in the <coughs> skin they do not have glands they have dry cornified skin with epidermal scales known as scutes external ear opening is not there tympanum is the one represents the ear right now we don't have any ear pinna heart is three chambered but four chambered in crocodile crocodile is an exception so here also incomplete double circulation they are also cold blooded right now from pisces to reptiles all are cold blooded snakes and lizards they shed the skin as skin cast this is very important sexes are separate one is uh, nag another is nagini right nagin so they are male and female internal fertilization oviparous direct development kilone is turtle testudo is tortoise chameleon is tree lizard kelotes is garden lizard crocodilus is crocodile alligator alligator hemidactylus is wall lizard in snakes naja is cobra bangaris is crate viperis viper fine okay cool enough cool enough guys all right next next we have aves in aves we have adaptation for flying as you can see a bird you can see beak the four limbs are modified into wings there there is a presence of feathers most of them can fly except flightless bird like ostrich like kiwi like penguin right they have beak hind limbs have scales and are modified for walking swimming clasping and like duck it swims na so its hind limbs are adapted for swimming skin is without glands only one gland is present oil gland on the tail that is preen gland endoskeleton is fully ossified that means it's bony but long bones are empty inside you call it as pneumatic bones why to lessen their weight so that they can fly digestive tract have crop and gizzard guys crop and gizzard is also present in the gut of insect like cockroach and it also in the aves so crop helps in storage of food gizzard helps in churning of food they have four chambered heart warm blooded animals respiration is by lungs and lungs have air sacs air sacs are additional chambers which will supplement the respiration okay internal fertilizations one is male bird one is female sexes are separate they are oviparous and direct development let's talk about examples c4 corvus c4 crow columba is pigeon cetacula is parrot ceta ceta means ct whistle who who whistles parrot whistles right struthio is ostrich o it has o in it so ostrich pavo is peacock aptenodytes is penguin and neophron is vulture and apteryx is kiwi okay next let's see how do they look this is vulture neophron ostrich cetacula pavo next last is the mammalia then we are done with the entire ncrt of animal kingdom see guys so here okay someone is asking ma'am it is homeothermic yes homeothermic are warm blooded only okay so next we have mammalia habits you can find them everywhere polar caps we have bears in deserts we have camel mountains we have monkey forests we have monkey in the grasslands we have horses in the dark caves we have bat 
so some of them have adapted to fly or live in water like we have the one which lives in water that is your uh, whale and dolphin the one that flies your bat unique mammalian character is that they have milk producing glands known as mammary glands they have two pair of limbs their skin have hair all the characters your yeah right so they have ear pinna different types of teeth are there four chamber heart warm blooded or homeotherms they have lungs for respiration sexes are separate internal fertilization all are viviparous except one ornithorhynchus it is oviparous duct bill platypus and development is direct there is no larvae next example you can see the example ornithorhynchus duct bill platypus macropus is kangaroo here then we have uh, this balenoptera this is the blue whale and uh, you can see this one Tyropus is a bat. Tyropus is a flying fox or bat. Let me write all other examples also. Delphinus is dolphin. Is dolphin. Camelus is camel. Camelus is camel. Right. So all these are like equus is horse. Ratus ratus is rat. All these are the examples of your mammals. And canis, who is canis? Canis is dog. Phallus is cat. Panthera leo, lion. And Panthera tigris is tiger. So here we have completed 11 standard syllabus. We'll be starting the 12th class shortly, and uh, and uh, we'll start it after 30 minutes. We'll have a break for lunch. You guys also go have your good good lunch. Feel good. Eat something very nice. Okay. Whatever. What is your favorite dish? Eat that today. Whatever is your favorite dish, just eat that. Whatever it is, but it should be healthy so that you should not uh, feel uh, your upset stomach for tomorrow. Just for example, if I say uh, I like um, pulao, that rice with vegetables. So I, I love that you should eat that. Okay. So if you like, uh, you, you know, this mutter paneer, go for that. If you like sambar, dosa, you go for that. So eat something good because when you eat good, na, you feel good. All right. Okay. So we'll meet uh, after 30 minutes, guys. So let's have a break of 30 minutes. Yes, you can eat rasgulla also if you like rasgulla. Whatever you feel nice eating, you eat that. Okay. Which whatever is your favorite food. All right. Okay. Chole bature. Okay. Today you can have chole bature, but don't uh, take it tomorrow on the exam date. Okay. <laughs>
can you hear me guys can you hear me can you hear me can you hear me now can you hear me yes give me thumbs up if you can hear me yes all right all right all right okay 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 so now we are going to start with your human reproduction chapter so first thing that is very important in human reproduction is why do testes are there in the scrotum why it is extra abdominal the reason is because we want to maintain a temperature there temperature lower than the body temperature to 2.5 degree celsius lower than the body temperature fine next <clears throat> the root of sperm root of sperm the sperm exit from seminiferous tubule seminiferous tubule where it gets formed from seminiferous tubule it goes to rete testes Yes, from rete testes it goes to vasa efferentia. From vasa efferentia it goes to epididymis. From epididymis it goes to vas deferens. Vas deferens loop over the urinary bladder, meet with the duct of <coughs> seminal vesicle. So seminal vesicle duct and duct of vas deferens they unite to form ejaculatory duct. To form ejaculatory duct. Now this ejaculatory duct will open through urethra to the outside. So this is the root of sperm. So one such topic is very important. So that's why I brought the uh, structural question here. Now what are the three uh, glands present in the human male? One is <coughs> prostate gland, you can see. Another is seminal vesicles. Prostate gland, bulb urethral glands and seminal vesicle. Out of this prostate is one, these two are paired or two two, right? So uh, this uh, this thing sh you should take in, take care of that which is the single gland that's a prostate. Okay. Next we have is oogenesis and spermatogenesis. Now what's the difference? First of all, the basic question that can be asked: Which of the following cells are haploid? Which are diploid? So the one which have the word gonia in them first germ mother cells or gonia and primary word in them. They all are diploid. They all are what? Diploid. So we'll start with spermatogenesis. First is <coughs> spermatogonia, germ mother cell. It undergo mitosis and differentiation. And from primary spermatocyte, which in which first meiosis takes place. So which one always does meiosis one? Whether it is the female or male, uh, that will always be the primary one. Primary spermatocyte or primary oocyte. So in males, the spermatogenesis, it starts during puberty. Okay, then <clears throat> secondary spermatocytes are formed two in number from one cell and which will undergo meiosis two to form spermatid. Now what will st spermatid do? They will get converted into spermatozoa. The process of conversion of spermatid from spermatozoa is permeogenesis. Permeogenesis, right? Now, the sperms, they are attached to the Sertoli cell like this. So once they get mature, they will leave the Sertoli cell. They will leave the Sertoli cell and enter into the lumen. Enter into the lumen of seminiferous tubule from where they will be sent to rete testes. So this process of where the Sertoli cell and sperm, they are going to get away from each other. They, it will leave the head of Sertoli cell or the head of a sperm will leave the Sertoli cell. This process is known as permeation. So, spermiation is when <coughs> sperm gets released from the Sertoli cell. That is permeation. Spermiogenesis or spermatiliosis is formation of spermatozoa from the spermatid. Okay. Now about oogenesis. Unlike that of spermatogenesis, it starts at embryonic stages or during embryonic stages. So when a female is in the womb of a mother, at that time when her ovary has been formed, the oogonia will start to produce primary oocyte and primary oocyte will start meiosis 1 but it will get at halt of prophase. 
and now the female is born her childhood will be spent and when she will hit the puberty at puberty this primary oocyte has to uh, undergo or it has to complete meiosis one so what happen in a female when a female is born she is born with a number of primary follicles like this or primordial follicles the primordial follicles have primary oocyte and a lot of granulosa cells right this is these are around 2 to 20 lakhs during birth but during puberty only 60 to 80000 of primary follicles are left okay so this is primary follicle so when she'll hit the puberty the level of fsh will rises and one of a primary follicle out of number of primary follicle during one one menstrual cycle one follicle gets developed okay right so this primary follicle in the presence of fsh it will turn into secondary follicle in secondary follicle we have this primary oocyte both these primary oocyte are at halt of meiosis one right so but the only difference is it has more granulosa cells and one theca layer so a theca layer is present in which follicle guys it first appears in secondary follicle and secondary follicle also have primary oocyte. Now, as FSH level more rises, as the FSH level more rises, the follicle gets converted into tertiary follicle uh, and here the primary oocyte will uh, finish it meiosis 1. So, here you can see the secondary oocyte is formed. The secondary oocyte is present in the tertiary follicle. Which follicle guys? Tertiary follicle. Okay, so here the primary oocyte will undergo and finish it meiosis 1 in the tertiary follicle. There is a line in the NCRT, first the tertiary follicle will form and then it will undergo or complete its meiosis 1. So here this secondary oocyte, it will form a layer around it and that layer is zona pellucida. Zona pellucida is non-cellular or acellular, that means it does not have any cells. And it is surrounded by the cells known as corona radiata. And then there will be theca which will be differentiated into theca interna and theca externa. And then a small cavity will start to form. Here all these are granulosa cell. A small cavity will be formed and the name of the cavity is entrum. This is your tertiary follicle guys. Tertiary follicle has secondary oocyte in it. So it's in the tertiary follicle state. After tertiary follicle, more FSH will be there and it will convert into graphene follicle. The only difference in the graphene follicle and the tertiary follicle is that graphene is a mature follicle and it is larger in size and it has a very large entrum. And also this undergoes ovulation. When there is more FSH, the follicles are growing and follicles are the rich source of estrogen. So more the estrogen, uh, then comes the LH and LH will cause ovulation, rupture. After ovulation, this center portion will go outside in the oviduct and whatever is left, it will become corpus luteum. And other portion with the secondary oocyte, zona pellucida and corona radiata. It will go in the oviduct, whereas this uh, corpus luteum will be there in the ovary and this will secrete progesterone. It will secrete progesterone. Okay. Now here. Now the secondary oocyte will remain in the secondary oocyte stage until it gets the sperm. So if this secondary oocyte gets a sperm, only then it will complete its meiosis 1. If it does not get the sperm, the meiosis 2 will not be completed. Okay. Sorry, I said meiosis 1 earlier, right? It will only complete its meiosis 2 if it will get the sperm. Because here also it undergoes halt. And this halt is at metaphase. And when, when will this halt will uh, be disappeared? When the sperm will enter into the cytoplasm of the ovum. So when the sperm enters the cytoplasm of the ovum, it will uh, trigger the cytoplasm or the you know entire metabolism of ovum. And there MPF will be disappeared. APC NFA is promoting factors will come more. Fine. Okay. Next we have is... Uh, uh, Ovum can also be known as ooted. The another name of ovum can be ooted. Okay. All right. So the next portion that I'm going to discuss is about this diagram. So as you can see, a number of sperms are coming and fertilizing the egg. Right. So what are the things that uh, helps in fertilization? The sperm, if you have seen, sperm's head contains nucleus and this portion known as acrosome. Right. This is neck portion. 
this is middle piece this is tail this contains a lot of mitochondria this one contains centriole so the only part that enters inside the ovum is the nucleus and proximal centriole so this nucleus and proximal centriole okay acrosome contains contains all the enzyme that helps in digestion of the walls of the ovum so this is the only thing that is present in the oviducts waiting for the sperms to come so now as a first sperm you can see this is the first sperm it has touched the layer known as zona pellucida what will happen when the first sperm enters here, it has to enter through digesting the layers. First, it will digest the hyaluronic acid between the cells. So, acrosome will secrete the enzyme hyaluronidase. Hyaluronidase digests the hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is a mucus containing polysaccharide, right? Uh, so, it will digest that first and it will also secrete CP corona penetrating enzyme and then zona lysin or acrosin that will digest zona pellucida okay zona lysin or acrosin okay so once the first sperm enters and it touches the zona pellucida the entire membrane cell membrane of the ovum it changes it gets depolarized and this is how it will resist other sperms to enter why we say why there are around 200 to 300 million sperms per ejaculation in which 60% should have normal shape and 40% should have normal motility right so we say that uh, there are millions of sperm that are reaching oviduct then why only one sperm fertilize it the reason is because when first sperm enters and touches the zona pellucida this will cause depolarization of the of the ovum membrane now no other sperm can enter only one sperm the first sperm can enter once it is depolarized no other sperms can enter there okay that's the reason next guys which we are going to discuss is this important one development in which phase does what type of development take place so the first in human being during first month the heart is formed and heartbeat starts and one can hear it with the help of stethoscope by the end of second month of pregnancy the fetus develop limbs and digits we say that one two three four five six seven eight and nine there are three trimester there are total nine months of pregnancy and one trimester is of three months first trimester First trimester is very sensitive in terms of growth because in first trimester almost all the organs are formed. It's a kind of miniature human being is formed. Later on in all the size increases the more development it takes place. Okay, And uh, we also say that during first uh, trimester MTP is safest. That is abortion, medical termination of pregnancy. So <clears throat> by the end of second month here the limbs and digits are formed. By the end of 12 weeks, that means the first trimester, most of the major organ systems are formed. For example, limbs, external genitalia, well developed. Okay, next, fifth month. F for fifth, F for first movement, right? Here. First movement of the fetus and appearance of hair on head usually are absorbed during fifth month. Then, at the end of 24 weeks, that means at the end of second trimester, the body is covered by fine hair, eyelid separate eyelashes are formed. That means eye developed and start to open. At the end of 9 months, the fetus is fully formed and ready for, ready for to come to the world for delivery. So, we are talking about delivery, that's parturition. What about it? Parturition, one, uh, some things that you have to remember about it it's neuroendocrine mechanism because neurons are also involved and hormones are also involved okay and the signal or the reflex of fetal ejection reflex that you say it occurs from not just fetus though its name is fetal ejection reflex it comes from fetus and mother both right which hormone is responsible for fetal ejection reflex oxytocin Right, and oxytocin, more the oxytocin, more the contraction. Whose uh, or whose pituitary releases oxytocin? Maternal pituitary. Maternal pituitary. Okay. Next thing uh, about is milk or the mammary glands. Milk production. Milk production. Which hormone helps in milk production? Prolactin. And which helps in milk letdown? oxytocin oxytocin okay 
Second thing about hormones. So what are the female hormones that we have talked about? Follicles give estrogen, corpus luteum gives progesterone. What are the hormones which are secreted by placenta? So placenta secretes HCG. HCG mimics LH and this is the indicator of pregnancy also. Next, HPL, human placental lactogen. It helps in the development of mammary glands. Also, relaxin is secreted during pregnancy. Uh, okay, so we are talking about placenta. So let's not write this one. Estrogen and progesterone. Okay, whereas relaxin is secreted by ovaries. That means corpus luteum is the source of relaxin. Corpus luteum is the source of relaxin. It relaxes pubic symphysis so that the baby should come out easily. Okay. Then uh, there are also other, uh, certain hormones that increases in several folds like thyroxin. Because more the thyroxin, thyroxin's one function is it helps in differentiation of tissues. More the thyroxin, more tissues will be differentiated in the growing baby. Alright guys. Very nice. Very nice. Royal army. Girl. Okay. Next we have is uh, reproductive health. In reproductive health, we will be discussing about all the contraceptive methods. Okay. First of all, natural. We have natural method. We have barrier method. We have pills. We have IUDs. We have implants. We have sterilization. Okay. First, in the natural method, what are the different methods here? Periodic abstinence. So, what we do in periodic abstinence? If we know that, if we know that, um, if we know that in the periodic abstinence uh, or if we know that in the menstrual cycle, uh, the 14 days is the day of ovulation and a couple does not undergo sexual intercourse for day 10 to 17. How many days? 10 to 17 days of a menstrual cycle. If there is no sexual intercourse on the day 10 to 17th of a menstrual cycle of a female, the chances of pregnancy can be very less. Fine. But again, it has a lot of side effects. One such side effect is that it has a failure rate. You never know the female's ovulation took place in, on uh, the ninth day and uh, a couple has undergone intercourse on nine day. That could be a pregnancy. Right. Second is coitus interruptus. Coitus means sexual intercourse. In this, uh, the penis is taken out from the vagina before deposition or insemination. What is insemination? Deposition of the uh, semen in the female's vagina during sexual intercourse. Okay. So uh, the male takes out the penis before that. That is coitus interruptus. And the last is lactational amenorrhea. In lactational amenorrhea, we have a lot of things to do here with the uh, hormone. Amenorrhea means no menses. So, uh, after parturition or delivery of baby, female feeds the baby for around 6 months and her inner body prolactin level is very high. So, more the prolactin, it will give negative feedback to FSH and LH. There will be no follicle development, no ovulation, no menstrual cycle. But this is also having a lot of failure rate. Why? Because you never know when the female's hormones are up and the pregnancy takes place. So, this has a lot of things to do with the hormones and which hormone? Prolactin. Okay, then barrier method we have condoms, fem shields which are female condoms, diaphragm, volts, cervical caps. Cervical caps are inserted in the cervix, diaphragm and volts in the vagina, fem shields in the vagina, condoms on the penis. Both condom and fem shield. Both condom and fem shield, they prevent STD. How does a barrier method function? They do not allow the meeting of sperms and ova. They do not allow the meeting of sperms and ova. They are like a barrier, a wall between the two. Fine. Pills. In pills, we have oral pills. One is steroidal. Another is non-steroidal. In non-steroidal, we have Saheli. Saheli is estrogen receptor inhibitor. It's a once in a week pill. It will inhibit estrogen receptor. Whereas steroidal pills, they are like progesterone. They are like progesterone, like LNG20. More the progesterone, negative feedback to the pituitary and there will be no ovulation. There, It also alters the nature of uh, uterus or uh, endometrium. So you can say that 
it will also inhibit implantation it also thickens the cervical mucus so these steroidal can also be taken as emergency contraceptive pills fine guys next iud's intrauterine devices intrauterine devices they are inserted in uterus they are of different type like copper t or copper containing copper t 200 like copper 7 multi load 375 they all are copper containing these uh, iud's they will increases phagocytosis of sperm the iud's function is that it increases phagocytosis of sperm also copper ions they increases the immunity of a person and of a female and the body of female will treat sperm as foreign foreign particle and kill it then in inert we have lipase loop this is a kind of uh, inert iud and in hormonal we have like lng20 so it has a lot of things to do with the hormones so hormonal if any hormonal device is lng20 the function will be similar the mode of application can be different for example in pills it's also lng20 you are eating it this one is inserted hormonal iud is inserted in the uterus fine next yes yes i will explain the art also don't worry gotham okay then we have implants implants are uh, subcutaneously implanted in the skin they are of two type nor plant and implant on they also contain lng20 that means they also have hormones like lng20 so one such question can be which of the following works through hormones hormonal iud works through hormones right uh, then your uh, name of the hormone iud can be progesterone cert like right uh, the pills progesterone is the iud's name right and implants also work through hormones and lactation laminoria also work through hormones okay guys then then we have sterilization it is a terminal uh, method here we have the surgical or you can say it is a surgical method we have tubectomy in females where, where the fallopian tubes are cut down and vasectomy in males where uh, vasectomy in males where vast difference is cut down in this one we only block the transport of sperm everything will go normal the person uh, the female will be having natural menstrual cycle there will be natural uh, you know sexual desire libido everything will be fine the only transport is inhibited in this method and this is irreversible that's why it is known as sterilization fine okay let's talk about art lipis loop explain again ma'am bhuvan so uh, lipis loop are inert they are basically made up of steel or barium sulfate and it has certain chemicals present on it right uh, but poly it is made up of like steel or polyethylene and it is coated by sulfur oh sorry barium sulfate so what happened it's a kind of a foreign object when it goes to the uterus it is uh, the object is like a foreign so immune system will be triggered there and it will uh, uh, you know enhanced immune response will be triggered against the iud but when the sperm will enter inside the uterus because iud has already triggered the immune response that triggered immune response will also kill the sperms there increasing the phagocytosis of sperm so that's why we say iud is increases phagocytosis of the sperm whereas copper one also increases phagocytosis and also suppresses the sperm motility the copper ones they also suppresses the sperm motility these copper ones they suppress sperm motility okay but in general we say that all the iud's all the iud's they increases phagocytosis of sperm okay that's the difference all right let's talk about art first of all what is artificial insemination in artificial insemination the semen sample is taken from the male if a male have a low sperm count only then we do artificial insemination so what are the various thing we have what is uh, first we have is artificial insemination in the art why do we do art when a male or female is infertile one is artificial insemination artificial insemination is done on those male which have low sperm count so what we do uh, we take a lot of semen sample what is a semen uh, the fluid that uh, is uh, uh, that's a male uh, that comes from male reproductive system which have the secretions of the glands of male and sperm so we take that sample we take that sample in more quantity because in per ejaculation the sperms are less so we have to take number of ejaculations so that are artificially deposited in the female's vagina which will ensure 
मोर चांसेस ऑफ फर्टिलिटी ओके और दी फर्टिलाइजेशन सेकेंड टेक्निक दैट वी हैव गाइस इज आई वी एफ इन विट्रो फर्टिलाइजेशन इन इन विट्रो फर्टिलाइजेशन वॉट वी डू वी टेक ओवा एंड वी टेक स्पर्म इन आर्टिफिशियल कंडीशन लाइक इन लैब इन लैब सो फर्टिलाइजेशन टेक्स प्लेस इन विट्रो आफ्टर फर्टिलाइजेशन जाइगॉट इज फॉर्म्ड वॉट इज फॉर्म्ड जाइगॉट इज फॉर्म्ड After zygote embryo is formed, if the embryo is less than eight cell stage, less than eight cell stage, or if it is embryo, this can then be transferred in the fallopian tube, because in fallopian tube further development will be taken place. Okay, and this technique is known as SIFT, zygotic intrafallopian transfer. You are uh giving transfer or you are transferring the zygote in the fallopian tube but it's not just the transfer of zygote it is also the transfer of embryo which is less than 8 cell stage if the embryo is more than 8 cell stage more than 8 cell then it is transferred in the uterus and you call it as intra uterine transfer iut okay sometime these embryos transfer is also known as et embryo transfer i hope that's clear to everyone this is, these are one such techniques second techniques that we are going to discuss here is gift and icsi so remember gift is a gift to a female because female is not able to produce ova so we are giving Gift to a female. So this is the ovum from donor, right? Then you transfer into fallopian tube. Gametic intrafallopian transfer. What gamete are we transferring? If I'm saying gametic intrafallopian transfer, we are transferring a gamete in the fallopian tube. So definitely in fallopian tube there should be ova, right? So we are taking ova from donor and transferring in the fallopian tube. Now there. the in vivo fertilization will take place the sperm will come either through sexual intercourse or artificial insemination fertilization will take place and simple pregnancy will occur right in icsi if a sperm does not have a proper shape if a sperm does not have a proper shape what we do we take a petri dish we put ova in that and with the help of micro injection micro needle micro injection we give injection of a sperm we give injection of a sperm this is what your icsi intracytoplasmic sperm injection is all right okay so that's all about reproductive health guys next we have human health and disease so we'll be discussing about some diseases ncrt uh, of some diseases okay first is typhoid so typhoid occurs due to salmonella typhi salmonella typhi and salmonella typhi it comes through uh, your uh, uh, you know fecal oral transmission or we can say contaminated food and water so what are the symptoms of typhoid and mary mallen is also related with typhoid she was a cook by profession you all know the story of it right salmonella typhi is a pathogenic bacteria which causes typhoid fever in human beings so because it's a fever is one of a very important symptom so you also call it as enteric fever right the typhoid can also be known as enteric fever because that fever comes from gut and the other name that we use for gut is enteric right these pathogen generally enter the small intestine through food and water with them and migrate to other organs through blood sustained high fever weakness stomach pain constipation headache loss of appetite that means you are not able to eat anything are the common symptom intestinal perforation and death can also case in some cases typhoid fever can be confirmed by which test vidal test okay that's important so we'll be covering only the important diseases guys okay then pneumonia so pneumonia uh, can be due to streptococcus bacteria or it can also due to haemophilus bacteria so any of these bacteria can cause pneumonia in fact pneumonia can also be caused by virus or fungus okay but the most common one are these bacterial so that's why we study in bacterial 
The symptoms of pneumonia include fever, chill, cough, headache. In severe case, the lips and fingernails may turn grey to bluish, uh, bluish in colour. So, what happened in pneumonia? The bacteria enters the alveoli. Imagine this is the alveoli and infect this. So, whenever there is an infection, there is excessive mucus production and because it is destroying the cells, so the uh, fluid from outside will also enter. So, that is extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid which will decrease the surface area for the exchange of gases and hence causes the pneumonia so one such kind of uh, uh, symptom is lips and fingernails becomes blue in case of pneumonia okay next common cold common cold occur due to rhinovirus which virus guys rhinovirus so, in this there is a rhinitis, inflammation in nasal passages. So, common cold is characterized by nasal congestion and discharge, sore throat, hoarseness, cough, headache, tiredness, etc. And which usually lasts for 3 to 7 days. Right? 3 to 7 days. Okay? Then, alright, alright, alright. Next guys, next disease is malaria. Next we will be discussing is malaria. So, malaria occurs due to plasmodium and the vector is Anopheles, female Anopheles mosquito, female Anopheles mosquito. So, half of the life it completes in the man, the primary host, host is the man and half in the, half in the mosquito. So, what happened here is the most dangerous uh, Plasmodium is Plasmodium falciparum. It causes malignant malaria. It causes malignant malaria and it can be fatal. Okay. So, when the uh, mosquito bites, so where does uh, uh, it goes? For example, today a mosquito bites to me and and it contains the plasmodium okay so the sporozoite of that plasmodium from its salivary gland will go into my body then to my liver in liver it will turn into merozoite and keep on multiplying 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 and later on goes to my rbc there also it will keep on multiplying so whatever multiplication it is doing in my body is asexual so from my liver it goes to rbc so now it will burst the rbc so when rbc will burst hemozoin granules will be uh, will be formed and they will be released hemozoin granules have been formed by the breakage of hemoglobin right so those hemozoin granules will cause fever now of uh, the uh, the merozoid that have came out from the rpc one of them has become a female gamete other becomes a male gamete but these both gamete cannot grow in human being why because the temperature has been raised they will stop there no more development now if one another mosquito come and bite to me and take those gametocytes in its gut when the mosquito will bite to me the blood it will suck it will be containing pro uh, gametocytes male and female and it enters into the mouth of the mosquito and in the gut of the mosquito both will grow and undergo fertilization and thereafter fertilization zygote will undergo sporulation and form sporozoite which will through hemocele enter in the the livery gland of mosquito right this is how the entire uh, uh, entire cycle of plasmodium it works fine so malaria yes it uh, causes anemia yes it also damages your liver okay guys okay all right all right next let's talk about uh, the types of immunity so here from here the questions are usually formed immunity types one type of immunity is your adaptive and innate in innate immunity in innate immunity we have two barriers the first line of defense and the second line of defense in the first line of defense we have two type of barriers physical barrier and physiological what does it mean physical barrier like a wall like skin is your physical barrier mucous membrane is your physical barrier physiological like skin is secreting lactic acid that's a physiological or i say the acidic ph of stomach is physiological lysozyme in tear and saliva is physiological okay in second line of defense we have cellular barrier in which we have neutrophils 
in which we have neutrophils, we have our NK cells, and then uh, we also have cytokines. What are cytokines? These are glycoproteins which are secreted by virus infected cell. Secreted by virus infected cell. Okay. Then in adaptive, in adaptive one, we have memory cells formation. Innate is from birth. You got it from birth. Adaptive, you take it after birth. So in the adaptive immunity, there are two types of immunity or further we can say immunity classification can be done in this way also. One is your uh, active immunity, another is your passive. In active immunity, you have to come across or your body has to meet the pathogen or the part of the pathogen. So active immunity can be like for example, you got a disease. For example, you got chicken pox, then later on you get immune to it. That's the active immunity. Or you got a vaccine. That's the active immunity. Okay. In passive, you take ready-made antibodies or immune cells like IgA antibody in the colostrum. What is colostrum? The first milk of mother or IgG antibody from placenta. The fetus get it from placenta. Okay. And then the antivenom. Antivenom is also a kind of passive immunity. You know, uh, when the snake bites, they give you an injection and that's the antibodies formed against that venom, okay, or that poison. All right, okay, all right, all right, all right. Bhuvan, what's, uh, what's the point that you didn't understand? Please let me know. You have to write it down. Yes. Okay. Moving further to the another type of immune response. There are two types of immune response, guys. One is primary, another is secondary. The primary is known as amnastic and secondary is known as anamnastic. In the amnastic one or the primary response, uh, uh, you get or come across a pathogen for the first time. For example, you got chickenpox for the first time, you get diseased. So your Im immunity was low. That's why you got disease. But when the second time, the same pathogen, when it will come, like uh, the chickenpox virus again came to your body, then the chickenpox virus will not be able to cause you disease. Why? Because you have memory cells formed. That is the primary immune response. So primary immune response or an amnastic means when the same pathogen comes for the second time. Primary, it comes for the first time. There is low immune response. There is high immune response. Fine. Another type of immunity that you come across is humoral and cell mediated. Humoral and cell mediated. In humoral, B cells are participating in the immunity and here T cells. B cell will form the antibodies and kill the pathogen. That's humoral immunity. In cell mediated, T cell directly kill the pathogen. That is cell mediated immunity. Okay. So this is important. Okay. Yes. This is very important. You have to come across. Okay. So Om is saying, uh, please revise gastrula morula. Okay. No worries. So we can go for that. We can go for that. Let's just complete this portion first, guys. Human health and disease. Okay, let's discuss the drugs. Drugs. So we have two types of drugs, guys. One is psychotropic. Another is hallucinogen. Hallucinogen. Hallucinogen changes perception, reality. Example, LSD, cannabis. Atropa, Datura. Okay. In psychotropic, it can either increase or decrease the CNS activity. So here we have one barbiturates, benzo, diazepines. Right. We also have here opiates. In opiates, we have morphine, codeine, smack. Okay. Smack uh, is also known as heroin. It is white in color. It is basically chemical version of morphine. And you get morphine from poppy plant. Which plant? 
latex of poppy which part of poppy plant latex latex of poppy uh, have morphine in it and when you do the acetylation process it will become heroin so heroin is basically diacetyl morphine it is formed by the acetylation of morphine morphine is a powerful sedative and painkiller codeine is used in cough syrups okay smack is white in color it does not have any smell it is odorless it is bitter in taste and it is crystalline okay and then we have stimulants in stimulants guys we have coffee or we can say caffeine that's in coffee and tea then we have coke or crack coke or crack is obtained from erythroxylan coca coke or crack it interferes with the dopamine neurotransmitter it interferes with the dopamine neurotransmitter okay and if in low quantity it is taken it is a stimulant if it is taken in high quantity it is hallucinogen this one high quantity hallucinogen low quantity it is stimulant what a stimulant it increases cns activity okay then you have tobacco in tobacco you have nicotine nicotine goes to adrenal gland and releases adrenaline which increases your blood pressure right and that can even uh, uh cause uh you know uh, some other diseases like heart attack and so and it can also causes cancer so these are all drugs and cannabis is obtained from cannabis sativa or you also call it as cannabinoids 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 uh you must have seen their leaves in the ncrt green color leaves okay so cannabinoids they are obtained for cannabis and they are uh, abused by sports person so much okay all right so like om was saying ma'am please gastrula morula okay we'll go for that now okay guys so here let's talk about the developmental process so once the fertilization has taken place the zygote is formed after zygote in the fallopian tube two cell stage comes then the four cell stage and then 8 to 16 cell stage and that you call it as morula and the cells are known as blastomeres now this will go to fallopian tube where it is going in the fallopian tube imagine this all was taking place in the fallopian tube now uh, from fallopian tube this morula is in the fallopian tube it is leaving fallopian tube and entering into the uterus in the uterus we have this endometrium now this will get turned into 32 cell stage embryo 32 cell stage embryo but this 32 cell stage is now not known as blastula or blastocyst it will only be known as blastula blastocyst when it will form a cavity and that cavity is known as blastocele that cavity is known as blastocele so this structure is blastocyst then 32 cell stage blastula with the cavity known as blastocele and blastula or blastocyst is the one which will undergo implantation how we will see so the outermost layer of the blastocyst is trophoblast and inner it has these inner cell mass and inner cell mass differentiate into three germ layers later on this will get differentiated into epiblast and hypoblast fine when there is a, you know more development this inner cell mass gets differentiated into epiblast and hypoblast epiblast give rise to three germ layers what are these three germ layers ectoderm endoderm and mesoderm okay so if someone asks you which part of blastocyst form the three germ layer inner cell mass if someone asks you out of epiblast and hypoblast which forms three germ layer epiblast okay then the trophoblast cells they will form these villi like structures which will help in the implantation like this and these are known as chorionic villi what are these known as chorionic villi so on fourth to fifth day the implantation takes place and which embryonic stage undergoes implantation blastocyst okay guys any doubt any doubt in this you can tell me chorionic villi yes chorionic villi is extra embryonic membrane what are the other extra embryonic membranes we have we have like uh, amnion right we also have yolk sac amnion forms a bag which have amniotic fluid in it yes amnion is formed from ectoderm and endoderm all right next let's move further let's talk about what 
biotechnology in biotechnology the first thing that you need to learn is gel electrophoresis or you have to remember in gel electrophoresis we do separation of the cut dna you have already cut the dna the dna has been treated by restriction enzyme so the dna that has been restriction uh, has has been treated with the restriction enzyme we need to cut it the fragments we need to separate them so for separation of fragments we do this technique gel electrophoresis in gel electrophoresis we use a gel that's why its name is gel electrophoresis that is agros gel which is taken from red algae which algae guys red algae electrophoresis means we are using electric field what we do we put a piece of dna here we put dna here and dna is negatively charged so when we and on the other hand we have anode here what we have anode so when we switch on this separators the dna being negatively charged will move around the positively charged anode and the gel the gel this agarose gel this entire is a gel it have pores in it so this dna when it is running towards anode it has to pass through these pores so the smaller fragment can easily pass through the pores so we say that the smaller fragment is the fastest one the smaller the fragment the farther it will move okay second thing this effect is known as sieving effect sieve means channi in hindi see we you used to you know uh, filter the uh, tea after you make the tea right so just like that the larger particles of tea they get stuck in the sieve the uh, the uh, liquid part it flows just like that the larger particles will stuck here and smaller will run because this gel the uh, dna has to pass through the gel to move okay another thing you cannot uh, visualize the dna right now because it's transparent and gel is also transparent so we need a dye and the name of the dye is ethidium bromide so if you have this dna strand and here you have like nitrogenous bases this ethidium bromide will stack in these nitrogenous bases so when you will pass the light uv light you will see orange color bands so for example if this is the gel you are watching the orange color bands like this why because you have stained it with the ethidium bromide and you are passing the uv light so on passing of uv light only you can visualize the bands otherwise on the naked eye you cannot do it and even if you have stained it without uv light you will not be able to visualize the bands okay all right okay very nice very nice next topic which is very important here is your pbr322 the vector right so this vector you first you should know where are the restriction site so the restriction site are first on the tetracycline resistance then on the ampicillin resistance in the ampicillin resistant it has the restriction site for pvu1 and psc1 and here for bam h1 and sal1 okay so if i use bam h1 if i use bam h1 as the restriction enzyme my piece of dna will move here or if my piece of dna has been uh, uh, has been attached here then tetracycline resistant gene will be vanished and this bacteria which have this recombinant plasmid will be sensitive to tetracycline it is known as insertional inactivation remember what happened in what happened in insertional inactivation if a dna has if a dna or a gene has foreign dna in it the gene which have foreign dna will be damaged and hence it will not be able to perform the function it was performing what was the function of this gene this will make the bacteria resistant to tetracycline because this gene is damaged the bacteria is no more resistant to tetracycline it is sensitive to tetracycline so this is one thing that you need to do guys okay this is one thing that you need to do otherwise we also have blue white selection what we do in blue white we have their gene as selectable marker what are selectable marker the genes that will help you to uh, distinguish between transformant and non transformant recombinant and non recombinant for example if a gene is present here it is a recombinant one but maybe there are certain colonies which do not have this so those are those are non recombinant one 
okay the one which have the plasmid are transformants one which do not have the plasmid are non transformants one so in the number of bacteria you need to find out which is transformant or not okay so for that we use selectable marker for selectable markers can be antibiotic resistant genes like in case of pbr322 we have ampicillin resistance and tetracycline or it can be like lagz gene that produce beta galactosidase so if beta galactosidase if beta galactosidase is produced that means the foreign dna has not been added on it and white color substrate will turn into blue so if the colony's color is blue that is non recombinant if the colony's color is white that is a recombinant okay guys yes is it clear tell me tell me is it clear or not okay next next we have is pcr next we have is pcr so pcr is polymerase chain reaction so what happen here is first step that occur is denaturation then annealing and extension this is what you need to know in denaturation two strands are separated in annealing we add primers in extension the enzyme tag polymerase will come for addition of new nucleotides this is what is pcr this is what you have to learn in it okay all right so what's the function of pcr it will increase the number of what's the function of pcr yes what's the function of pcr it will increase the number of dna strand it's polymerase lac operon is in the botany guys i can't teach you that let's talk about application part in application the most important topics are first of all golden rice so what we have done in golden rice we have added vitamin a second is bt cotton so bt cotton is pesticide resistance what we have done in bt cotton bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria so this bacteria have gene cry gene okay so this cry gene we added in the cotton plant and that becomes pesticide resistant because this cry gene it form endotoxin in the protoxin form pro means inactive when it goes in the gut of the insect which is alkaline it will become endotoxin now this cry gene is specific to the plants and crops like cry 1 ac and cry 2 ab cry 1 ac and cry 2 ab they are for cotton ball worm and cry 1 ab is for corn borer similarly different crops different pest for different type of genes okay then we have rna interference we uh, have uh, made pest resistant plant here again pest resistant plant how did we make the pest pest resistant plant guys by using rna interference technology what is the name of the plant tobacco what was a pro problem to the tobacco plant root knot disease and it was uh, caused by melidogyne incognitia a nematode so what technique did we use we did we used rnai in rnai whenever there is double stranded rna whenever there is double stranded rna it leads to the it leads to the it leads to the yes production of that enzyme which can digest the rna okay so we produced uh, or we formed uh, uh, the technology rna interference technology we used and we added the genes into the tobacco plant we added genes into the tobacco plant and these gene produces two rna rna1 and rna2 these two rna being complementary to each other being complementary to each other they form double stranded rna and it initiated rna interference and once rna interference started in tobacco plant now if the nematode comes for the infection the nematode will be dead okay right namrata i cannot speak hindi because the name of the channel is pw english okay all right guys yes royal army girl yes guys this is revision this is revision we are just revising things up okay fine so in the rna interference we have added the genes in tobacco plant to initiate rna interference all right next 
नेक्स्ट 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 कोडिंग एंड नॉन कोडिंग नित्य अगेन दैट्स इन दी बॉटनी ओके नेक्स्ट गाइस अनदर थिंग हियर इज द इंसुल इंफॉर्मेशन एली लीली वॉज अमेरिकन कंपनी दैट फॉर्म इंसुलिन हाउ डिड दे फॉर्म दे टुक टू बैक्टीरिया एडेड टू प्लाज्मेट इन दिस प्लाज्मेट वन प्रोड्यूस ए पेप्टाइड चेन another produce b peptide chain and both the chains were then assembled by forming disulfide linkages this is how they formed mature insulin why didn't they took the entire uh, gene of the insulin why did they put it separately because insulin is formed as a pro insulin form so because we are eukaryotes we can Uh, convert it into the mature form by breaking the C peptide chain, but here prokaryote the bacteria cannot do that. So that's why we have to do this technology. Eli Lilly had to do this. Very good, Siri. Very good, Naga Valley Siri. Yes, in 1983, American company Eli Lilly. Very good, very good. Next, guys. Next, we have gene therapy. so gene therapy was done for ada adenosine deaminase deficiency so by ada deficiency the immune system of a person can get low so what happen uh, any person who has ada deficiency they can be treated in three ways one either give them the injection of enzyme or go for bone marrow transplant or three gene therapy what we do in the gene therapy we take lymphocytes of patient we take lymphocytes of patient okay once we have taken lymphocyte now with the help of retrovirus now with the help of retrovirus we have added cdna which dna what is cdna complementary dna the dna that has been formed from rna because in animal cell the vector are retroviruses what are the vectors for animal cell retroviruses and micro injection what are the uh, techniques to transfer uh, dna into the plant ti plasmid which is a vector agrobacterium and second method can be biolistics or gene gun okay in bacteria what can be the method for gene transfer uh, transfer that is transformation where you will treat the dna with calcium ions then give heat shock at 42 degree celsius then put them back to the ice okay all right next all right next so we put the dna now we select these cells and put back to patient all right so if we perform the same technique in the embryonic stages it could be a permanent cure otherwise it is difficult you have to do this technique again and again if you are doing in the adult because these cells are mortal they will die they will die after some time so this technique is 100% success if you do in the embryonic stages all right okay that's about the um, biotechnology application just i want to uh, make you revise some terms what is bio patent bioethics biopiracy in bioethics these are standards rules that you that you have to do this thing or not or not in bio patent you are getting rights yeah, this thing is mine i have made this medicine in biopiracy you are you are thief you are misusing something without telling someone okay this is a difference only find these words your answer will be there and what is the committee that uh, uh, control all these bioethics and patent geac genetic engineering approval committee it is of an indian government genetic engineering approval committee fine okay next is your evolution so what about evolution guys what about evolution hurry up let me know so what's the most important topics in evolution we'll start it from now first we have is homologous organ homologous organs tells adaptive radiation or which evolution divergent evolution they show divergent evolution what are the examples here flippers or we can say uh, right away four limbs of vertebrates four limbs of vertebrates
brain of vertebrates heart of vertebrates okay another tendril of cucurbita and thorn of bougainvillea thorn of bougainvillea in homologous one thing that you have to keep in mind that always their group will be same like they all are from same origin vertebrates in analogous there will be convergent evolution there will be convergent evolution so what happened in the convergent evolution in cover in convergent we have sweet potato and potato we have lot of examples here wings of birds or apes insect mammals and also there is one more example if you remember no you don't remember eye of octopus and mammal also one more example placental mammals and marsupial and marsupial okay also marsupial shows adaptive radiation if you remember what is adaptive radiation they start from origin and they go like this what is this adaptive radiation so what are the examples of adaptive radiation guys the examples of adaptive radiations are darwin's finches marsupials and marsupials okay all right another important topic there in the uh, evolution is your hardy weinberg equilibrium hardy weinberg equilibrium so what does hardy weinberg says hardy weinberg says if the population is large and there is random mating and there is random mating see from here the questions are asked yes yes uh, rajwardhan is asking ma'am disulfide bonds in insulin yes there are disulfide bonds formed between the two peptide chain ma'am business studies padha do really <laughs> you think i can teach business studies i am a medical i was a medical student kabir kabir no kabir no here we teach only zoology okay <laughs> and in english all right so if the population is large and there is random mating just random mating and there is no mutation no natural selection no gene flow no genetic drift then the genetic equilibrium will be maintained that means the sum total of all the frequencies will be one so if p is the allelic frequency of dominant and this is of recessive their sum will be one so let's make a square root of it p square plus 2 pq plus q square is equal to one so that's a genotypic frequency so this is the genotypic frequency of dominant heterozygous and recessive okay so you know sometimes the questions are asked like allelic frequency of dominant is 0.6 like tell the allelic frequency of recessive 0.4 p plus q is equal to 1 use this one or if they are asking about genotype frequency multiply by 2 or square not multiply by 2 square it up that's okay right that's it all right guys so that's hardy weinberg equilibrium one thing that you have to study here in detail is genetic drift what is genetic drift darwin said what was the theory of darwin darwin said that there are two key concepts of darwin okay so now i'm not writing i am uh, just uh, listen it like a story okay we'll st we'll study all the uh, theories first is lamarck's theory lamarck said that use and disuse of organ or theory of inheritance of acquired character He said giraffe was of the size of a dog and when the entire plantation on land finished it just put up its neck and the length and the length of the neck 
elongates and this is how he used an organ and that gets specialized and that character goes to the progeny but this is absolutely incorrect nobody uh, you know uh, uh, nobody believes in this theory anymore why because the cells of neck are somatic cell change in the somatic cell will not lead to the uh, you know uh, inheritance only change in the germ cells are inherited this was done by mendel second thing then comes a uh, darwin theory theory of natural selection darwin said first of all there is a population which keeps on multiplying and multiplying right so some of them gets the uh, small scale variations or changes they adapt some changes which are no more visible because the uh, the uh, population is dividing and they are going so good but when the competition comes that small scale variation it comes up and the person with small scale variation get naturally selected and the one which is naturally selection selected lives other dies and that forms new progeny new species fine so the two key concept of darwin was branching descent and natural selection now uh, according to darwin one population that gets small scale variation always gets selected and the other which do not have it vanishes so what if what if the organism which are naturally selected they run away from that population they can be selected now for example if i say there is a competition going on and if i don't play i am i i will not uh, lose because i don't play nobody knows nobody has decided so just like that is genetic drift in genetic drift we say organisms are not selected naturally only they can be selected by chance so if there is a sentence and that sentence have word by chance in it that is a genetic drift he explained it with founders effect in founders effect he explained darwin's finches darwin's finches was once in the south america they fly away to the other galapagos island okay so that's a founder effect they found new place in the south america they would have been died because the competition is going on but they changed their habitat and moved to new habitat right another is a bottleneck effect in which he said earlier Uh, like we have a bottle so if uh, the bottles neck uh, like we have entire bottle filled this much or this much number of cheetahs were present in the forest but when hunting start only the number of uh, uh, cheetahs left which can only fit into the bottle of that neck right so few cheetah left why because we hunted them so when we got to know they might got extinct we put them up from the forest and keep them in the zoo and there they get naturally selected Uh, rather they got selected by chance but if you put them back into the forest they will die because they are not naturally selected there we changed the habitat but they are not naturally selected in the forest and that is your genetic drift and that is your genetic drift right guys okay so let's talk about the human evolution but uh, let's take a break of 10 minutes because uh, i need some time right so let's have a break of 10 minutes and then we'll uh, finish the evolution and animal husbandry okay all right guys let's have a break of 10 minutes till then you revise what we have studied so far i need one water break you know <laughs> i want to have some water
all right guys that's it so we are going to start with human evolution can you hear me can you hear me guys can you hear me or not all right so we'll start with the human uh, evolution so everything starts from dryopithecus dryopithecus were were more man like uh, man like uh, animals or ancestors of humans they evolved around 20 million years ago and it is supposed that they were present in ethiopia and tanzania which gave rise to rama pithecus rama rama is lord ram like right so they were more man like rama pithecus was on the direct line of human evolution so it gave rise to australopithecus the fossil of rama pithecus was found on in the shivalik hills india the australopithecus had a cranial capacity of 500 cc they were just four feet tall they have only one curve in the vertebral column they didn't even have curves they all were frugivorous they eat fruits and uh, australopithecus was also living in the east african uh, grasslands around three million years ago then it gave rise to homo habilis homo habilis is an able man skillful man he was a tool maker he made tools for the first time and he also eat fruits and his cranial capacity was 650 to 800 cc so you can see the increasing trend in the cranial capacity that tells about human evolution then after homo habilis was homo erectus he had all the curves in its uh, vertebral column his uh, uh, fossils were found in the java uh, island indonesia and he, he probably ate meat he knew the use of fire he was the first who knew the use of fire he had the cranial capacity of 900 cc which gave rise to homo sapiens it is believed that homo sapiens originate around 75 hundred uh, seventy five thousand years ago to one lakh years ago during ice age there were two types of homo sapiens that uh, came homo sapiens neanderthals neanderthals were the one uh, who came around seventy five thousand to one lakh years ago they have a cranial capacity of 1400 cc uh, and they had a religion they bury their uh, or the people who who uh, who dies and um, they bury them with their tools and flowers also they used to cover their body with hides hides are the clothes made up of animal skin or the leaves then come homo sapiens fossilis also known as cromagnon they are supposed to be more intelligent thus than us 1650 cc was a cranial capacity and then comes us homo sapiens sapiens with the cranial capacity of 1600 cc uh, you know prehistoric cave art has been found in the bimbetka uh, in Mahara, uh, in the madhya pradesh and you can see the cave art of the homo sapiens and it is believed that 10000 years ago agriculture came and the first animal they domesticated was dog this is about the human evolution and the evolution fine guys okay let's move further and uh, talk about the any uh, strategy so the question that is asked from the strategy is from animal breeding and artificial breeding techniques in animal breeding there are two types of breeding one is in breeding and another is out breeding another is out breeding in in breeding the male and female that are breeding because breeding what mating of the animals the male and female that they are mating they belongs to same breed and related they are related from four to six generation they are related from four to six generation in outbreeding these organisms these organisms can be of same breed but they can be unrelated same breed like that of inbreeding but here they are unrelated so what happen when we do inbreeding this leads to formation of pure lines because here comes their increase in homozygosity when homozygosity increases we want pure lines because the male and female both have superior genes and don't want that any other breed will come or any other organism will come unrelated and suppress that gene okay but it also increases homozygosity and uh, the in there is increase in more uh, uh, you know dangerous genes which may have been gone through selection fine and also this one decreases fertility so you call it as inbreeding depression 
This inbreeding depression can be overcome by outcrossing. So, for example, if any lines are undergoing in breeding depression, you can now perform outcrossing on them. So, it removes in breeding depression. Then comes the crossbreeding. In crossbreeding, both the animals they belong to different breed. Organism belongs to different breeds. Example, Hizardale. Hizardale was produced in Punjab by crossing Bikaneri Eaves and Merino Rams. And then interspecific hybridization. This is altogether different. In interspecific hybridization, the species has been changed. In all the above, the species was in fact Spain. Same. Here, S1 is crossed with S2. That means species are same. Example, mule. You are mating donkey and horse. The species is same. Okay. This is what it is. Okay. Another thing is uh, important in this one is artificial insemination. The artificial techniques of breeding. In artificial insemination, it is same as that we do in the man. In artificial insemination, we deposit uh, the semen from bull into the cows. The benefit of that is uh, with the semen of one bull, many cows can be inseminated and it is easier method than mating. Next is MOET. In MOET, multiple ovulation embryo transfer, what we do? We inject the cow. For example, if this is a cow, we inject the cow ovary with the injection what is in the injection fsh as a result number of eggs are released as a result number of eggs are released when number of eggs are released you call it a super ovulation so that's why multiple ovulation and now the fertilization will takes place and embryos will be formed once the embryos are formed inside the womb of the cow they are taken out non surgically and transferred to the surrogate mother in one shot, six to eight eggs are released. That is super ovulation. Normally, one egg is released per ovulation. And when the embryo comes to 32 cell stage, then it is transferred to the surrogate mother. Fine. This is what we do in MOET. This cow, yes, very nice cow. This is how my cow looks like. Okay, it also have horns. <laughs> so, uh, this is the technique that is done. Uh, 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 and this cow will be used again and again for ovulation. And the baby will be born in the womb of a surrogate mother. But biologically, this will be the mother having good genes. Fine. So, that's all about the animal breeding. So, the last topic that is left is your cockroach. So, what thing uh, that is the most difficult in the cockroach? I don't think so. Anything is any anything is difficult in the cockroach. Okay, so I'll be asking the question. Okay, first of all, tell me the body. Body is divided into head, thorax, abdomen. The head is triangular, hyponathus, jaws are directed downward, and head is formed by the fusion of how many segments? Six segments, right? Next, thorax is divided into prothorax, meso and meta the pro meso and meta they all have one pair of legs they all have one pair of legs but meso and meta they have one pair of wings in each the wings of meso they are thick leathery elytra they are also known as stigmina or wing covers whereas these hind wings or meta thoracic wings they are transparent and helps in flying abdomen is having 10 segments and these segments, even the thoracic and uh, the abdominal segment, they are covered by the sheets known as clarites. So here the chitinous exoskeleton is in the form of sclerites. There are three types of sclerites, the terga, sterna and pleurite. In each segment you will find two pleurite, one sterna, one terga. Terga on dorsal side. Sterna on the ventral side, right? MOET full form, the Bengali boy. Multiple ovulation, embryo transfer. Okay? All right, next. Uh, what about the various systems here in the cockroach? First of all, the digestive system. In digestive system, the most important topics are one, hepatic CK. Okay, let me just draw the diagram. This is the pharynx, this is esophagus, this is crop. This is gizzard, midgut, then we have hindgut and anus. This is how the system is. 
बिटवीन फोर गट एंड मिड गट आर प्रेजेंट ब्लाइंड सिक्स टू एट हिपैटिक सीगे दैट सिक्रीट इन साइन एंड बिटवीन मिड गट एंड हाइंड गट इज प्रेजेंट वन हंड्रेड टू वन फिफ्टी मालपीजन ट्रिब्यूल्स दैट हेल्प इन एक्सक्रीशन सो फॉर एक्सक्रीशन वी हैव मालपीजन ट्रिब्यूल एंड एक्सक्रीटिव वेस्ट इज यूरिक एसिड ओके एंड दिस पोर्शन इज प्रो वेंट्रिक्यूलस सॉरी और गिजार्ड ऑल्सो प्रेजेंट इन बर्ड्स इन साइड इट हैजिक्स काइटनस टीथ एंड आउटसाइड इट हैज सर्कुलर मसल एंड दिस इज क्रॉप फाइन गाइस नाउ रेस्पिरेशन इन कॉक्रोच इज थ्रू ट्रैकिया सर्क्यूलेशन ओपन सर्कुलेटरी सिस्टम हाउ मेनी चैम्बर हार्ट हाउ मेनी चैम्बर हार्ट थर्टीन चैम्बर हार्ट थर्टीन chambered heart fine and what is the body fluid known as this is the last chapter anjali uh, what is the body fluid of cockroach known as hemolymph it is known as hemolymph fine and what about the nervous system guys nervous system in nervous system what do we have we have two large ganglia supra esophageal supra esophageal it act as brain sub esophageal joined by connectives double ventral solid ganglionated nerve cord remember this is supraesophageal ganglion this is sub esophageal ganglion this one is a brain these are what connectives all right what do we have in the reproductive system of male cockroach what do we have in the male cockroach yes region love from pondicherry love from india from diksha ma'am love from pw <laughs> so in the male what are the uh, male what system does male have male have testes into 4 to 6 abdominal segment one pair male also have vas deferens male have mushroom gland these are accessory glands and mushroom glands are present between 6 to 7 abdominal segment which segment this is important 6 to 7 abdominal segment okay also male have fallomeres male's genital pouch male's genital pouch is formed between 9th and 10th segment which segment 9th and 10th segment and the genital pouch contains ventral gonopore ventral gonopore dorsal anus and fallomeres what are fallomeres gonapophyses when apophysis so this is what male's genital system or genital pouch contains okay now male uh, forms the packets of sperm known as spermatophore in the females on the contrary what do we have in the female on the contrary we have ovaries between 2 to 6 abdominal segment one pair and each ovary have eight ovarioles one ovary have eight ovarioles okay then the accessory glands like in male we have mushroom gland in the females we have okay first of all we'll talk about duct we have oviduct in females we also have spermatheca in females like males have packets of sperms packets of sperms known as spermatophore these spermatophores are deposited in this spermatheca and it is one pair one pair and in which segment sixth segment okay then in female we have accessory gland known as collateral gland these collateral gland produce utheke what are utheke utheke are cases which contains fertilized eggs how many eggs 14 to 16 eggs in two rows how many eggs 14 to 16 eggs in two rows and this is one utheke right 9 to 10 utheke are deposited at a single time fine all right okay so what about the genital pouch of female in female genital pouch is formed by 7 8 and 9 segment and 7 segment is boat shape it is boat shape and it contains spermathecal pores gonopores and collateral glands it contains spermathecal pores gonopore and collateral gland all right one more thing in the abdomen the male contains anal style so we say na male show more style in front of girls like this 
right just like that so male have anal style also known as caudal style female does not have but anal cerci they are present in the both fine guys okay so here we finish our entire syllabus of 11th and 12th so i have tried my level best to cover each and everything that is quite quite and very important i think some of the chapters we have done entirely also so guys see tomorrow is your exam right you all know that tomorrow is your exam the revision has been done right the revision has been done and if you have uh, listened to each and every word of mine today very carefully i don't think so there will be anything that will be left behind okay so tomorrow you'll wake up in the morning and uh, just sleep tight today i have a sleep of around 8 to 9 hours yes for sure not more than that not even 10 hours if you take around 7 to 8 it will be fine and you'll be more uh, you know uh, energetic eat nice do not eat anything unhealthy do not uh, uh eat it like from outside or any junk food eat healthy don't take stress at all tomorrow when you will wake up have good breakfast very light breakfast and uh, before examination center you are going to the examination center have some curd and uh, some you know sugar in that it's a tradition but it has a scientific reason too it increases the brain activity so do that definitely do that and be very positive so uh, do not think what will happen next will we will be able to solve some questions even i cannot say that will you be able to solve the question why because even i have not seen any question paper so the thing which we have not done it the things which we have not done it or uh, the things which we have not seen it the future which we have not seen it how can we predict it right now right but we can you know uh, make it better by thinking positive and uh, turning the future to the another level if we'll think negative and we, we are not calm maybe we will do something bad or we'll make two or three questions or mark them wrong it can be possible so staying calm is really very important at this point right from now to the exam just think you you know you have read it and you will be able to do it Right. So when I used to go to exam, I always think, yeah, I have read it. It's fine. So I try to convince myself I have read it once. So what's the matter? I can do it. And yes, so whenever you go with a calm mind and with a positive attitude, your exam is always good. Trust me, it will always go good. Right. So it is said that na, uh, some questions are, un, uh, you know, you cannot answer them. The answer is always you get the answer always on time and right time is always better to get those answers fine so it's quite deep you will not understand no problem <laughs> but uh, the thing is that just stay calm this is the only thing that you can do right now and you know don't think anything bad this is what it's going to reflect whatever uh, hard work you have done if uh, it's not we'll do it again no problem but right now just think you have to crack it you just have to think you have to crack it and you have to do every each and every question very nicely with calm mind start with the biology first whichever you like botany or zoology do biology first mark all the questions answers on the omr then go to the physics or chemistry whatsoever like and then mark its question and then to the other subject once you have covered one subject mark its answer on the way otherwise what happened in the last you have solved the entire paper but you have not marked in on the omr and that becomes really useless okay what do you need you need more than 600 marks to get a college what's the problem what's the problem you will get it now you will get it no worries just stay calm don't stress yourself don't just put your mind on the negative thoughts because mind can do one thing at a time either it can go positive or it can go negative now it's your choice where you want to get it eat healthy eat nicely uh, you know if you will be calm if you will be uh, you know positive your parents will always also be positive otherwise if, if they'll see you so upset they will also not like it Fine, and they will think, oh, that means you have not studied, and you don't want to do that drama at your house right now, right? <laughs> so just avoid all those things. What I've said you, and um, just do the things tomorrow. Wake up with a smile, and uh, if you you believe in God, just go to or in your house only. If you have a small shrine or temple, just uh, ask God to give the blessings, and that's it. Just read whatever you want to read. Just before exam, just stop reading anything, and don't feel you know. 
sometimes we have a thing that we started feeling oh so many students how will i be able to do it or sometimes an exam there are certain students who who don't know anything but they just act like they are marking every answer and they don't they know everything just imagine the other uh, student who is sitting next to you is your competitor right and you have to outshine them that's it that's it so that you can do your uh, exam well and you can get that seat so all the very best from my side that's uh, enough i guess and i also have to take some rest now <laughs> so here my blessings are with you all those students who were here with me from the starting of the lecture to the last all the very best to each and every student here who is right now or who will see the lecture later on also and you will crack it don't worry you will make it you will crack it and i'll meet you soon after you will clear your uh, uh, neat exam and get a college i will definitely meet you all right bye bye lots of love all the very best stay calm stay positive and confidence is the key confidence is the key do not be under confident this is the you know mind plays with us uh, when you know everything it started fooling you i you, i don't know anything i don't know anything don't fool okay don't fool yourself don't fool your mind and stay smart stay confident and play your game like a player right all right all the best thank you so much bye bye